Adolf Hitler, My Partner's Downfall, written and spoken by Spike Milligan. How it all started. September the 3rd, 1939. The last minutes of peace were ticking away. Father and I were watching Mother digging our air raid shelter. She's a great little woman, said Father, and getting smaller all the time, I added. Two minutes later, a man called Neville Chamberlain, who did Prime Minister impressions, he spoke on the wireless. He said, As from 11 o'clock, Today, we are at war with the Germany. I love that we bit. War, said Mother. It must have been something we said, said Father. The people next door panicked, burnt their post office books, and took in the washing. Almost immediately came the mournful wail of the first air raid warning. Is that you, dear, said Mother. It's a Jewish funeral, said Father. Quick, put out the begging bowls. It was, in fact, the Beta Shoe Factory lunch hooter. It caused chaos until it was changed. Uncle Willie, a pre-death mortician who hadn't worked for years, started making small wooden mushrooms. He sent them to Air Marshal Harris, requesting they be dropped on Germany to prove that despite five days of war, British craftsmanship still flourished. They were returned with a note saying, dropping wooden mushrooms during raids might cause unnecessary injury. My brother Desmond, too, seized with pre-pubic patriotism, drew picture after picture of fantastic war machines. He showed father. Son, he said, these inventors will be the salvation of England. They wasted no time. Carrying the portfolio of drawings in a string bag, they hurried to Whitehall by 74 tram. After several arguments and a scuffle, they were shown into the presence of a curious nose-manipulating colonel, he watched puzzled as father laid out drawings of troop-carrying submarines, tank-carrying zeppelins, and some of troops on rocket-propelled skates, all drawn on the backs of old dinner menus. Right, said the colonel, I'll have the brown Windsor, roast beef and two veg. Father and son were then shown the door, the windows, and finally the street. My father objected. You fool! By rejecting these inventions, you'll put two years on the war. Good, said the colonel. I, I wasn't doing anything. Father left. With his head held high and his feet held higher, he was thrown out. He took war very seriously. As time went on, so did Neville Chamberlain. He took it so seriously, he resigned. Good. He's stepping down for a better man, concluded Father, and wrote off for the job. One Saturday morning, while Mother was at church doing a bulk confession for the family, Father donned an old army uniform and proceeded to transform the parlour into HQ combined ops. Walls were covered in tatty maps. On the table was a 1927 map of Thomas Tilling's bus routes. Using wooden mushrooms as anti-tank guns, Uncle Willie placed them at various points on the map for the defence of broccoli. My father told the early morning milkman that, he said tapping the map, that is where they'll start the attack on England. But that's Africa, said the puzzled milkman. Ah, yes, said father, quick to recover, but that... That's where they start from, Africa. Understand? Uh, no, I don't, said the milkman, whereupon he was immediately nipped in the scrotum, thrown out, and his horse whipped into a gallop. Only two pints tomorrow, father shouted after the disappearing cart. Next morning, a constable arrived at the door. Ah, good morning, constable, said father, raising his steel helmet. You're just in time. Uh, in time for what, sir? In time for me to open the door for you, said father, reeling helplessly with laughter. Very funny, sir, said the constable. Knew you'd like it, said father, wiping tears from his eyes. Now, what can we do for you? A robbery? A murder? I mean, times must be bad for the force. Look, why don't you slap a writ on Hitler? It's about these barricades you put across the road. Oh, and what's wrong with them? We're at war, you know. It's not me, sir. It's the tram drivers. They're shagged out having to lift them to get through. They've got to come down. You're all fools, said father. I'll write to Churchill. He did. Churchill told him to take them down as well. He's a bloody fool too, said father. If he's not careful, I'll, I'll, I'll change sides. 
I was no stranger to military life. Born in India on the regimental strength, the family on both sides had been gunners back as far as the siege of Lucknow. Great-grandfather Sergeant John Henry Kettleban had been killed in the Indian mutiny by his wife. His last words were, Oh! His father died in the military hospital after being operated on for appendicitis. On the tombstone was carved, R.I.P., in memory of Sergeant Thomas Kettleband, died of appendicitis for his king and country. Now, apparently, it was my turn. One day, an envelope marked OHMS, 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 my father thought it was from the electricity board. Time for my appendicitis, I thought. For Christ's sake, don't open it, said Uncle, prodding it with a stick. The last time I did that, I ended up in Mesopotamia, chased by Turks, waving pots of Vaseline and shouting, Lawrence, we love you, in Ottoman. Father looked at his watch. Time for another advance, he said, and took one pace forward. Weeks went by. Several more OHMS letters arrived. Finally, at the rate of two a day, stamped urgent. Oh, the king must think a lot of you, son, writing all these letters, said Mother, as she humped sacks of coal into the cellar. One Sunday, while Mother was repointing the house as a treat, Father opened one of the envelopes. In it was a cunningly worded invitation to partake in World War II, starting at seven and sixpence a week, all found. Just fancy, said Mother, as she carried Father upstairs for his bath. Of all the people in England, they've chosen you. It's a great honour, son. Laughingly, I felled her with a right cross. I managed to delay the fatal day. I'll explain. Prior to the war, I was a keep-fit addict. Every morning you could see people counting the bones in my skinny body at Ladywell Recreation Track as I lifted barbells. Sometimes we were watched by admiring girls from Catford Labour Exchange. Among them was one with a tremendous bosom. She looked like the Himalayas on their side. The sight of this released some kind of sex hormones into my being that made me try to lift some impossible weight to impress her. Loading the barbell to 160 pounds, that's about $140, I heaved at the weights. Christ! An agonized pain shot round my back, into my groin, down my leg, and across the road to a bus stop. Crippled and trying to grin, I crawled cross-eyed with agony towards the shower rooms. Screams of laughter came from the girl. Oh, yes, said our neighbour, Mrs. Windust. You got a rapture come in. My husband had one from birth. All through our courting days, he managed to keep his secret. Course, on our honeymoon, he had to show me, and then I saw he was held together with a Garforp and Ollin's advanced leather truss. He had to have it remodelled before we could have sectional intercourse. Terrified, I hide me to my hearts of oak, sick benefit Hindu doctor who had practised in Broccoli Rise. Ah, oh, yes, Milligan. You are getting the rapture. I can feel it, he said, inserting curry-stained fingers like red-hot pokers in my groin. That diagnosis from a son of the BMA was 35 years ago. I'm not ruptured yet. Perhaps I'm a late starter. Rupture. The thought filled me with lumps of fear. Why, for three years I had been playing trumpet with the Ritz Rebels, a bunch of spotty musicians held together with hair oil. They paid the ten shillings a gig. Of this I gave Mother nine, who in turn gave seven to the church for the poor of the parish. I couldn't understand it. We were the poor of the parish. Blowing a trumpet puts a strain on the groin up to chest height, so every time we did a gig I improvised a truss. I stuffed rags into an old sock until it was packed tight. I then placed it in the predicted rupture spot and attached it to my groin with lengths of tape and string. This gave me a bulge in my trousers that looked like the erection of a stallion. Something had to be done. I mean, if some woman saw it, I could never live up to it. So I tried to reduce the bulge by putting leather straps around me and pulling them tight. Nothing happened except my voice went up an octave. It still looked obscene, but Mother came to the rescue. She sewed on an additional length of dyed black curtain which covered the bulge but brought the jacket halfway down my thighs. Embarrassed, I explained it away by saying, This is the latest style from America. Cap Calloway wears one. He must be a cunt, said the drummer. I had brought the evening dress from my Uncle Alf of Catford for 38 shillings. The suit was tight, but so was money, so I bought it. For weeks I played in my leather harness trussed up like a turkey. After a month I got saddle sores and went to the doctor, who passed me on to a vet. In turn he reported me to the police as a leather pervert. The pain in my back persisted. Sometimes I couldn't move for it. What I had was a slipped disc, a condition then unknown to the world of medicine. 
but to get a bad back at the same time as your call-up rings as hollow as a naked wife in bed with a lodger saying the laundry was late. In my case it was true, the laundry was late. I was put in Lewisham General Hospital under observation. I think a nurse did it through a hole in the ceiling. Specialists seeking security in numbers came in bunches of four to examine me. They prodded me, then stepped back to see what happened. She's still alive, said one. They then hit me all over with rubber mallets and kept saying to each other, what do you think? Days later, a card arrived saying, renal colic. The old man in the next bed leaned over and said in a hoarse voice, get out of here, son. I come in here with varicose veins and they took me appendix out. Thanks, I said. My name's Milligan. Mine's Ethel Martin, he said. Ethel? He says, dick on your chart. I was, when I come in, somewhere between here and there, and he pointed in an obvious direction. The unkindest cut of all? They got me mixed up with someone who wanted to be sterilised. How do you tell your wife you ain't what she thinks you are? Don't tell her. Show her. I'll think about it. Well, from now on, that's all you will be able to do about it. Those sons of fun at the hospital, having failed to diagnose my ailment, discharged me with a letter recommending electrical treatment and headed, to whom it may concern. I suppose that meant me. It was now three months since my call-up. To celebrate, I hid under the bed dressed as Florence Nightingale. Next morning I received a card asking me to attend a medical at the Yorkshire Grey Eltham. Son, said father, I think after all you'd better go. We're running out of disguises. In any case, when they see you, they're bound to send you home. The card said I was to report at 9.30. Please be prompt. I arrived prompt at 9.30 and was seen promptly at 12.15. We were told to strip. This revealed a mass of pale youths with thin, white, hairy legs. A press photographer was stopped by the recruiting sergeant. For great sake, don't. If the public saw a photograph of this lot, they'd pack it in straight away. I arrived in the presence of a grey, ashen-faced, bald doctor. How, how do you feel? He said. All right, I said. Do you feel fit? No, I walked here. Grinning evilly, he wrote grade one in blood red ink on my card. No black cap, I said. It's at the laundry, he replied. <laughs> the die was cast. It was a proud day for the Milligan family as I was taken from the house. I'm too young to go, I screamed as military policemen dragged me from my pram clutching a dummy. At Victoria Station, the RTO gave me a travel warrant, a white feather and a picture of Hitler marked, This is your enemy. I searched every compartment, but he wasn't on the train. At 4.30, June 2, 1940, on a summer's day, all mare's tails and blue sky, we arrived at Bexellancy, where I got off. It wasn't easy. The train didn't stop there. Part 2. I joined the regiment. Lugging a suitcase tied with traditional knotted string, I made my way to headquarters 56th Heavy Regiment Royal Artillery. Using sign language, they redirected me to D Battery. They were stationed in a building called Worthingholm, an evacuated girls' school in Hastings Road. As I entered the drive, a thing of singular military ugliness took my eye. It was Battery Sergeant Major Jumbo Day. His hair was shorn up his neck and seemed to go straight up the back of his hat, and his face was diffused red by years of drinking his way to promotion. Oi, where you been? This ain't a girls' school no more, isn't it? Never mind. I'll join the regiment instead, I said. He screwed up his eyes. You're not Milligan, are you? And actually, I am. A beam of sadistic pleasure spread over his face. We've been waiting for you, he said, pushing me ahead with a stick. He drove me into what was D Battery office. The walls, once white, were now thrice grey. From a peeling ceiling hung a 40-watt bulb that, when lit, made the room darker. A jankawalla was giving the bare floor a stew-coloured hue by slopping a mop around, rearranging the dirt. On the wall was a calendar with a naked tart advertising cigarettes. Below it was a newspaper cut out of Chamberlain grinning upwards. Fronting the fireplace was a trestle table covered with a merry grey blanket. A pile of OHMS letters, all addressed to me, were tucked in the corner of the blotter. In the lid of a cardboard box was a collection of rubber bands, paper clips, ceiling wax, string and a lead weight. My pulses raced. Here was the heart of a great fighting machine. Seated behind this mighty war organ was middle-aged, pink, puffy-faced man in his early fifties, wearing a uniform in its late seventies. Parts that had frayed had been trimmed with the leather. These included cuffs, elbows, pockets, gaiters, and all trailing edges. For this reason he was known as Leather Suitcase. 
His maiden name was Major Startling Grope. This is Gunner Milligan, sir, said the BSM. When they had both finished laughing, the Major spoke. Where have you been, and why are you wearing civilian clothes? Well, they wouldn't let me on the train naked, sir. I mean, why aren't you in uniform? Well, I'm not at war with anybody, sir. Silence when you speak to an officer, said the BSM. The Major, who was fiddling with a rubber band, slid it over his finger. Does this mean we're engaged, sir? Silence, said the BSM. I suppose, said Chutkish, you know you are three months late in arriving. I'll make up for it, sir. I'll fight nights as well. All these attempts at friendly humour fell on stony ground, and I was marched to a bare room by a bombardier. He pointed to the floorboard. You're trying to tell me something, I said. You obeyed, right? Right. Right. Bombardier. Oh, I'm a bombardier already? Ho, ho. Cheeky bastard, eh? Got the very job for you. He gave me a scrubbing brush with two bristles, showed me a three-acre cookhouse floor, and pointed down. You still try to tell me something. Leering over all this was the dwarf-like battery cook, Bombardier Nash, who looked like Quasimodo with the hump reversed. He was doing things to sausages. Three hours scrubbing and the knees in my trousers went through. To make matters worse, there were no uniforms in the queue stores. I cut a racy figure on guard, dark blue trousers gone at the knees, powder blue double-breasted chalk striped jacket, lemon shirt and white tie, all set off with a steel helmet, boots and gaiters. It wasn't easy. Halt! Who goes there? I challenged. When they saw me, the answer was, Peace off! I had to be taken off guard duties. In time, I got a uniform. It made no difference. Halt! Who goes there? Peace off! Words can't describe the wretched appearance of a soldier in a new battle dress. Size had nothing to do with it. You wore what you got. Some soldiers never left barracks for fear of being seen. Others spent most of their time hiding behind trees. The garments were impregnated with anti-gas agent that reeked like dead camels and a waterproofing chemical that gave you false pregnancy and nausea. The smell of 500 newly kitted rookies could only be lightened to an open Hindu sewage works on a hot summer's night by Delius. To try and cure my beady, I salted it and hung it outside in thunderstorms. I took it for walks. I hit it. In desperation, I sprayed it with eau de cologne. It made little difference except one night a sailor followed me home. Overcoats were a huge, shapeless, dead loss. If you wanted alterations, you took it to a garage. But the most difficult part of army life was the 0600 hours wakening time. In films, this was done by a smart bugler who silhouetted against the dawn with the Union Jack flying Blue Revalley. Not so our badgie, or bugler, who stayed in bed, pushed the door open with his foot, blew Revalley, and then went back to sleep. Dunkirk. The first eventful date in my army career was the eve of the final evacuation from Dunkirk, when I was sent to the OP at Galley Hill to help the cook. I had only been in the army 24 hours when it happened. Each news bulletin from the BBC told an increasingly depressing story. Things were indeed very grave. For days previously, we could hear the distant sound of explosions and heavy gunfire from across the channel. Sitting in a crude wood OP heaped with earth at two in the morning with a Ross rifle with only five rounds made you feel so bloody useless in relation to what was going on over the other side. Five rounds of ammo, and that was between the whole OP. The day of the actual Dunkirk evacuation, the channel was like a piece of polished steel. I had never seen a sea so calm. One would say it was miraculous. I presume that something like this had happened to create the Angel of Mons legend. That afternoon, Bombardier Andrews and I went down for a swim. It would appear we were the only two people in the south coast having one. With the distant booms, the still sea, and just two figures on the landscape, it all seemed very, very strange. We swam in silence. Occasionally, a squadron of spitfires or hurricanes headed out towards France. I remember so clearly Bombardier Andrews standing up in the water, putting his hand on his hips, and gazing towards where the BEF was fighting for its life. It was the first time I'd seen genuine concern on a British soldier's face. I can't see how they're going to get him out, he said. We sat in the warm water for a while. We felt so helpless. Next day, the news of the small armada came through on the afternoon news. As the immensity of the feat became apparent, somehow the evacuation turned into a strange victory. I don't think the nation ever reached such a feeling of solidarity as in that week at any other time during the war. Three weeks afterwards, a bombardier Keen who had survived the evacuation was posted to us. What was it like? I asked him. Like, sir, 
is a fuck up. Ali successful fuck up. Summer 1940. Apples be ripe, nuts be brown, petticoats up, trousers down. Old Sussex folk song. Apart from light military training in Bexhill, there didn't seem to be a war on at all. It was a wonderful shirts off summer. Around us swept the countryside of Sussex. There were the August cornfields that gave off a golden hiatus, each trembling ear straining up for the sun. The land girls looked brown and inviting and promised an even better harvest. On moonlight nights, haystacks bore lovers through their primitive course. By day there was shade of plenty, oaks, horse, chestnuts, willows, all hung out hot wooden arms decked with the green flags of summer. The WVS Forces Corner on the corner of C and Cantaloupe Road was open for tea, buns, billiards, ping-pong and deserters. The women's voluntary service girls were jolly nice, that is, they were undateable. We tried to bait them with woodbines disguised in a player's packet and trying to walk like John Wayne. The other excitement was watching German planes trying to knock off the radar installations at Pevensey. Bombardier Rossi used to run a book on it. It was ten to one on against the towers being toppled. Weekends saw most officers off home and mufti. Apparently the same went for the Germans. The phony war was on. I was now a trainee signaller, highly inefficient in Morse code, flags and helio lamps. My duties were simple a week in every month at an observation post overlooking the channel. We had three, Galley Hill, Bexhill, a Martello Tower Pevensey and Constable's Farm on the Bexhill Eastbourne Road. Most of us tried for the Martello Tower on Pevensey Beach, as the local birds were easier to lay, but you had to be quick because of the tides. My first confrontation with the enemy was an early autumn evening at Galley Hill. The light was going and a mist was conjuring itself up from the channel. I just finished duty and I was strolling along the cliff, enjoying a cigarette. In the absence of a piano, I was whistling that bloody awful Warsaw Concerto, when suddenly nothing happened. But it happened suddenly, mark you. A moment later, I heard the unmistakable sound of a Dornier bomber, 103 feet long, wingspan 80 feet, speed 108 miles per hour, piloted by Fritz Gruber, aged 23, with a gold filling in his right lower molar. Suddenly, below me, coming out of the mist, was the Dornier, flying low to avoid radar and customs. I could actually see the pilot and co-pilot's face lit by a blue light on the instrument panel. What should I do? A pile of bricks. I grabbed one, and as the plane roared over me, I threw it. Blast! Mist! But in that moment I envisaged glorious headlines. Lone gunner brings down Nazi plane with lone brick. Investiture at Palace. Milligan M.M. And the Germans, mein Gott, if this is what they can do with bricks, what will they do when they get the guns? They didn't all get away. That week a hurricane downed at Dornier on Pevensey Marsh. We ran to the crash. It was going to be a bad year for the rear gunner. He was dead. The young blonde pilot was being treated by the battery cook, Gunner Sherry, who had been discharged from the army on grounds of insanity, then invited to join up again on the same grounds. He held the pilot with a carving knife. We were rather short of meat. Before the RAF recovery unit arrived, we knocked off anything movable, including a dead German's boots. The rear gunner's spando was handed to Leather Suitcase, who tried to raffle it. However, after discussions, he decided to use it as an ACAC gun. He really was getting the hang of things. A pit was dug outside Trevisic, the officer's billets. One morning, on the last stag, 0400 to 0600, I heard a Dornier circling in the low cloud. What a chance! I uncovered the spando. I could see the headlines again. Milligan Downs another. King takes back MM in part exchange for VC. A window opened. The lathered face of leather suitcase appeared. Milligan, what are you doing down there? Everybody's got to be somewhere, sir. Well, what are you doing? Uh, going to have a crack at the hunter. Don't be a bloody fool. You'll give our position away. Now cover that gun before it gets spoilt. As he spoke, there was a lone explosion. The Dornier had dropped a bomb in Devonshire Square. You see what you've done, he said, slamming the window. He must have been worth two divisions to the Germans. It's going to be a long war. Churchill had a tough job on. It was thanks to him we had any guns at all. When the 1418 war ended, Churchill saw that the 9-2s were to be dismantled, put in Greece, and stored in case of future eventualities. There was one drawback. No ammunition. 
This didn't deter Leather Suitcase. He soon had all the gun crew shouting, Bang! in unison. Helps keep morale up, he told visiting Alan Brooke. By luck, a 9.2 shell was discovered in the Woolwich Rotunda. An official application was made. In due course, the shell arrived. A guard was mounted over it. The mayor was invited to inspect it. The mayoress was photographed alongside it with a V for victory sign. I don't think she had the vaguest idea what it meant. A month later, application was made to HQ Southern Command to fire the shell. The date was set for July the 2nd, 1940. The day prior, we went round Bexhill carrying placards, saying, The noise you will hear tomorrow at midday will be that of Bexhill's own cannon. Do not be afraid. Other men went round telling people to open their windows, otherwise the shock waves might break them. Even better, they were told, break the windows yourself and save the hanging around. Dawn, the great day, we were marched to a secret destination on the coast known only to us in the enemy. Freezing, with the gathering fog, we all sat in the corner of a windy beach that was forever England. They told us, listen for the bang and look for the splash. Before the visiting brass arrived, the fog had obscured the view. The order now became, listen for the splash. Zero hour, tension mounting. A lance bombardier was arrested for sneezing. A Jewish gunner fainted on religious grounds. Lieutenant Button was stung by a bee. Lashing out with his hand, he struck Captain Martin's pipe, driving the stem down his throat, leaving just the bowl protruding from under his lips and fumigating his nose. Disaster! Sergeant Dawson, assistant instructor of signals, reported the line to the gun position had got a break. Signalers divine and white, who would do anything for a break, set off. In the haste to defend the Sceptred Isle, the south coast was a mass of hurriedly laid, unlabeled telephone lines, along walls, down drains, up men's trousers, everywhere. After thirty minutes, the OP telephone buzzed. Ah, said Dawson hopefully. OP here. We haven't found the break yet. Right, keep trying. The fog was now settling inland. Top brass had finished the contents of their thermos flask and withdrawn to the shelter of a deserted fisherman's cottage. All was silent save the sound of frozen gunners singing the International. Every ten minutes, for two hours, signal a divine phone and gleefully reported, Line still broken, Sarge. The fog was very dense, as were signalers divine and white, who were now groping their way through Sussex in Braille. CO's patience being exhausted, a runner was sent to the gun position. Off went Gunner Balfour, the battery champion athlete's foot. Another hour. He was lost. In despair, Sergeant Dawson bicycled to the police station, telephoned the gun position and told them, Fire the bloody thing! A distant boom. At the OP we heard the whistle as the rare projectile passed overhead into the channel. A pause, a splash, and then silence. It was a dud. How could the Third Reich stand up to this punishment? Next day at low tide, we were sent out to look for traces of the lost projectile. We didn't, but it was a very nice day for that sort of thing. Life in Bexhill, 1940-41 In Bexhill, life carried on. We went on route marches, which became pleasant country walks. Her favourite marching song was Come Inside. It went like this. Outside a lunatic asylum one day, a gunner was picking up stones. Up popped the lunatic and said to him, Good morning, Gunner Jones. How much a week do you get for doing that? Fifteen bob I cried. He looked at me and he went tee-hee, and this is what he cried. Come inside, you silly bugger, come inside. I thought you had a bit more sense. Working for the army, take my tip. Act a bit balmy and become a lunatic. You get your four meals regular and two new suits besides. What? Fifteen bob a week and a wife and kids to keep. Come inside, you silly bugger, come inside. No matter what season, the Sussex countryside was always a pleasure. But the summer of 1941 was a delight. The late lambs on spring heel legs danced their happiness. Hot, immobile cows chewed sweet cud under the leaf-choked limbs of June oaks that were young five hundred years past. The musk of bramble and blackberry hedges, with purple-black fruit offering themselves to passing hands, poppies red, 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 tracking the sun with open-throated petals, birds bickering aloft, bibulous to the sun, white fleecy clouds passing high, changing shapes as if uncertain of what they were to be. 
to break for a smoke, to lie in that beckoning grass and watch cabbage-white butterflies dancing on the wind. Everywhere was saying, be thank it. It was hop-picking time. In 1941, the pickers were real cockneys who, to the consternation of the ARP wardens, lit bonfires at night and sang roistering songs under the stars. Right, fags out, fall in. Of course, I'd almost forgot the war. But people were saying it would be over by Christmas. Good. That was in 12 weeks' time. I started to read the situations vacant in the Daily Telegraph and prematurely advertised Gunner 954024, retired house-trained war hero, unexpectedly vacant, can pull a piece of string and shout bang with confidence. Part 3. How We Made Music Despite I took my trumpet to war. Da, 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 da. I thought I'd earn spare cash by playing Fall In, Charge, Retreat, Lights Out, etc. I put a printed card on the battery notice board showing my scale of charges. Fall In, 1 and 6. Fall Out, 1 shilling. Charge, 1 and 9. Halt, 648 pounds. Retreat, pianissimo, 4 shillings. Retreat, fortissimo, 10 shillings. Lights Out, 3 shillings. Lights Out, played in private, 4 shillings. While waiting for these commissions, I'd lie on my palliasse and play tunes like Body and Soul, Can't Get Started, Stardust. It was with mixed feeling that I'd played something as exotic as You Go To My Head, watching some hairy gunner cutting his toenails. Of course, I soon contacted the jazz addicts. I was introduced to a six-foot-two, dreamy-eyed gunner, Harry Edgington, a Londoner. He was an extraordinary man, with moral scruples that would have pleased Jesus. It was the start of a lifelong friendship. Harry played the piano, self-taught. He delighted me with some tunes he had composed. He couldn't read music and favoured two keys, F-sharp and C-sharp, both keys the terror of the jazz man. However, over the months I'd bust tunes with him in the naffy. I taught him the names of the various chords and he was soon playing in the keys that made life easier for me on the trumpet. He was always game for a jam, any time. And of course, start to harmony tune, and Harry would be in harmony with you on the spot. It helped life a lot to have him around. One day, with nothing but money in mind, I suggested to Harry we try and form a band. Harry grinned and looked disbelieving. Just the two of us? Well, we could sit far apart, I said. A stroke of luck, a driver. Alf Files was posted to us with suspected rabies, and he played the guitar. All we needed now was a drummer. We advertised in part two orders, wanted a house-trained drummer, academic training advantage, but not essential, applied to the gunners Milligan and Edgington. No coloureds, but men with names like Duke Ellington given preference. No one came forward. We were stuck. Worse, we were stuck in the bloody army. <laughs> but Milligan had the eye of an eagle, the ear of a dog, and the brain of a newt. We've all got to eat. One meal a day, as the dining hall rang to the grinding of teeth on gritty cabbages, came the sound of a rhythmic beat. It was a humble gunner hammering on a piece of leaseland bacon, trying to straighten it out for the kill. This was driver Douglas Kidgel. Would he like to be our drummer? Yes. Good. Now where to get the drums? Gunner Nick Carter said there was a certain drum kit lying fallow under the stage of the old town church hall. Captain Martin, a sort of uh, commissioned Ned Kelly, suggested we requisition the certain drum kit to prevent it falling into German hands. This sort of patriotism goes deep. The Germany poised to strike, we couldn't waste time. We took the drums and camouflaged them by painting on the artillery crest. Kijil soon got the hang of the drums, and lo, we were a quartet. After a month's practice, Captain Martin asked, could we play for a dance? I told him we had a very limited repertoire, and he said, so have I. We'll hold the dance this Saturday. Gad! This was the big time. The old town, Church Hall, Bexhill. Who knows? Next week, Broadway, Hollywood! In entertainment star Bexhill, the dance was a sellout. The old corrugated iron hall was packed to suffocation. There were old women, kids, officers, gunners, various wives, very much a village dance affair. After twenty minutes, we'd exhausted our repertoire, so we started again. I suppose playing Honeysuckle Rose forty times must be some kind of a record. The bar did roaring business, the barman being none other than the Reverend Clegg, regimental vicar. We played well on into the night. About two o'clock, Captain Martin called a halt. They all stood to attention. We played God Save the King. Now for the rewards. To pay us, Captain Martin led us into the churchyard in pitch darkness. There he gave us a ten-shilling note. It's a little something for you, lads, he said. Ten bob, said Files painfully. 
Could we raffle it? Now that lads, remember there's a war on, said Martin, pocketing the rest. That night, by a flickering candle, we all swore allegiance to Karl Marx. No matter what, next dance, unless we got paid more, we'd play that bloody awful Warsaw Concerto. On pay nights, most of the lads headed for the pubs, where, apart from drinking, a lot of singing was done by the battery duettists Gunner White and Devine. This was one of their popular ones. I paid my entrance fee to see that tattooed she. She had Sir Hubert Tree tattooed upon her knee. She had the great big Union Jack tattooed upon her back. And down below on her big toe, Jack Johnson done in black, she had a battleship tattooed upon her hip. And where I could not see a map of Germany, she had a picture of Harry Lauder, right across where she gets broader. And as a mixture, she had a picture of a home in Tennessee. White and Devine were great fans of the band and travelled everywhere with us. Devine, who fancied himself as a Bing Crosby in uniform, often took the vocals. In the months to come, we enlivened many a lonely military camp. We saw life. In Upper Dicker, we played for a dance come orgy. Couples were disappearing into the tall grass having it off, and then coming back to the dance. God knows how many coitus interrupti the hesitation waltz caused. But we heard screams from behind the trees. Music has a strange effect on drunks. One lunatic ripped open his battle wrist, pointed to a scar on his chest, and shouted, Dunkirk! I ripped mine open and showed him my appendicitis. Lewis from hospital, I said. He had a face made from red plasticine by a child of three. That or his parachute didn't open. Do you hear me? You bloody coward Dunkirk! He kept saying. I had no idea what he meant. I confused him by giving him the ladies' spot prize. A fight broke out with the Canadians. They were all massive men. How do you get such huge men? I asked one. We go into the forest, shake the trees, and they fall out, he said. A wired officer rushed up. Can you play the maple leaf forever? No, sir. After an hour, I get tired. You're under arrest, he said. In despair, we played the king, shouted everyone back to their own beds, and departed. On Bexhill seafront stood the Delaware Pavilion, named after Lord Delaware Pavilion, a fine modern building with absolutely no architectural merit at all. It was open just in time to be bombed. The plane that dropped it was said to have been chartered by the Royal Institute of Architects, piloted by Sir Hugh Casson, with John Bethjeman as the bomb aimer. The invasion of England, though always imminent, did not stop the reopening of the pavilion for dancers by the local Rotary Club. The band could now play on a genuine stage, and a naffy piano-ridden Edgington could perform on a concert Steinway Grand. Our MC was Mr Courtney, who was well known in Bexhill. He owned an antique shop, and when short of stock, put his suits in the window. Occasionally he sang Mighty Like a Rose in a quivering light baritone, or Mighty Like a Baritone in a quivering rose which suggested he had a maladjusted truss. He told us he thought Charlie Coombs was the greatest jazz pianist in the world. In his own words, he's a sort of white Duke Ellington. During the months leading into the winter of 1940, D. Batty were the centre of nightlife in war-ridden, sinful Bexelon Sea. I didn't know it at the time, but I was taking the first steps into show business. Religion! Religion! Men in uniform can't really be considered religious, unless it be a Christian profundity that makes a gunner say, Jesus Christ, when he drops a shell on his foot. Even the battery chaplain was suspect. One night I found him face downwards near the officer's billet, singing, The Lord is my shepherd. Granted, it may have been a new way of holding services during heavy shelling. The Catholics had occasional visits from Father Holy Thing, who seemed horrified at the thought of any soldier having sexual intercourse. Oh, be careful of strong drink, my sons, he warned. Bear in mind it excites the sexual appetites. Therefore, if you see a comrade drunk, bring him home and bathe the parts in cold water. It was great to know how to be a Christian. All you needed was an erection and a bucket of cold water. He warned, avoid loose women. I told him straight that some of the women we were going out were so loose they were falling to bits. Anyway, we had nothing to do with loose women. We were all sleeping with highly respectable officers' wives, whose husbands were at the war. In our rough soldier way, we were trying to comfort them. One man was comforting so many, he was excused clothes. Food. Oh, oh, those military meals. Breakfast could be recognised by shape. Sausage, yes, but lunch. That white, watery mound could be spuds. 
But what was that heap of steaming green and black, and that knoll of boiled grey stuff that shuddered if you saw it? Visits from the orderly officers did little to help. Any complaints? Yes, sir. It's this. Oh, what's wrong with this? Uh, nothing wrong, but what is it? Officer calls the head cook. Sergeant, this man wants to know what this is. Uh, that, sir, is the frappe mystique a la Eldershot. We implemented our meals in the naffy with Cornish pastries or the eternal doughnuts. In early days, doughnuts were liberally dusted with caster sugar, but as the war went on, they stopped. War was coming nearer, even for doughnuts. The cookhouse staff consisted of two ex dustmen and the chef, Sergeant Paddy Harris, with multiple B.O., black nails, and halitosis. Medieval court poisoners couldn't have picked a more lethal trio. I could never help feeling they were paid by the Ministry of Bacteriological Warfare. Sergeant Harris was a regular. He went every morning without fail. In 1923, he was downgraded to B2 because of varicose veins that made his legs look like the maps of England's inland waterways. Still a citizen of the Republic, he spent his leave in Dublin. As far as the Irish were concerned, he was sabotaging the British war effort, and the way he cooked, they weren't far out. Every evening, Harris could be seen leaving the billet, his service dress stuffed with tins of fruit, cream, and other wartime goodies that he laid at the feet of his mistress prior to coitus. When he first met her, she was a little six-stone darling. When we left Bexhill two years later, she weighed fourteen stone and owned a chain of grocery stores. In 1940, he returned from leave with a piglet in his bag. He intended to fatten the animal and serve it to the battery for Christmas dinner in exchange for simple seasonal gifts, like 15 shillings a portion. The pig was called Brian Baru, and I asked why. Why, said Harris, sitting up in his reeking bed, to keep alive the legend of a king. He threw up his right arm in a romantic gesture, at the same time scratching his ass with his romantic left. He stood up, pulling on shattered, seaman-ridden underpants. The blood of kings runs to all the Irishmen. He opened the window and spat out. You dirty bugger! Came a cry from below. Harris's billet was... Well, it appeared to have been bombed by blockbusters filled with unemptied Arab dustbins. The only thing of any merit was a picture of Jesus stuck up with the drawing pin. It bore the legend, I will bless the house in which this picture is glorified. I wonder what went wrong. The piglet. It was housed in an old Libby's milk box lined with rubbish. The keeping of pigs in barracks was forbidden, so Harris gave the creature two coats of white paint with patches of brown that near as damn it made it look like a cocker spaniel. The pig got bigger and had to be repainted as a Great Dane. At night it went foraging. Lieutenant Button awoke one night and he phoned the guardhouse. Am I drunk? he inquired. No, sir, said the duty NCO. In which case, said Button, there's a pig painted brown eating my boots. We tried to tether the animal, but it broke the chain. There was only one solution. Dig a pit six foot deep and drop the animal in. Sensing our intentions, it broke free and dashed squealing over the football pitch. Seeing our Christmas dinner disappearing, we gave chase. Heading up the road to St. Leonard's, it suddenly turned right. No, my God, no, said Bombardier Dawson, as the pig rushed up the steps and threw into the front door the Belgravia guesthouse for the fine gentlefolk. Screams issued forth, the crockery was breaking. Entering the hall, we saw chaos, a bald man laying face downwards on his back with a grandfather clock across him. A fat, bursting woman was clutching a gross of Pekingese. My darlings, he trilled through a rouge hole. On the landing, a fine old man with a roll newspaper was flailing away at nothing and shouting, Shoo! Shoo! A toothless crone issued forth, stirring a saucepan of thrice-watered porridge. Behind her, a blind man holding up sagging trousers appeared at the WC door. "'There's no paper, Mrs. Erdl,' he said. "'In the cellar!' screamed a refined voice. Down we raced. Up we came with the blind man, bound hand and foot, still looking for a paper. "'It's the wrong one,' said Harris. Down we raced again. A woman on the top step kept shouting, "'Mind my bottle quinces!' At last we got the animal up. We were covered in cuts, bruises, and bottle quince. The pig was unmarked. With a noose around his neck, he went as quiet as a lamb. Who, said the vast landlady, who is going to pray for all this damage, eh? Sergeant Harris, braces dangling low, bowed. That's no bloody good, she said. Madam, every last penny will be repaid, said Harris. He took her vile hand, kissed it, passing on his hereditary gingivitis. 
Somewhere on the steppes of Russia, squadrons of red tanks were advancing on all fronts. But England too was in there, somewhere. Hastings had had the pleasure of sounding their sirens about fifty times, Eastbourne about forty, but Bexhill sucked unrecognised. Then it came. A Wednesday night, late in March 1914, the band was doing a gig at a private house in Pevensey Drive. A well-heeled ex-army major was throwing a house party on the occasion of his daughter's coming of age. It had the cobwebs of a dying empire. Men wore slightly dated evening dress. There was one joker from the blues with cavalry spurs. The ladies were in gowns of chiffon that seemed straight from the wardrobe of private lives. It was pretty horsey, but not outrageously so. Though I, glad to say, the moment we played a 6-8, they all did the cocking of the legs, a sort of English version of the Highland fling. As a parting gift, our host gave us each a fiver. We stood stunned. I'm sorry, said Kajiru, we haven't got any change here. He waved us off. Outside in the dark, we loaded our gear onto the 1,500-weight truck. Looking up, I saw the night was alive with stars. In the eastern sky, I could make out Saturn, Pegasus, Castor and Pollux. I could hear the distant sound of sea washing the pebbled beaches of Pevensey. The Romans must have heard it once. We drove back in silence until Alf File spoke. Five pounds? He last threw back when he said was up. It was gone one o'clock when we rolled ourselves in our blankets for the big black, as Kidgel called sleep. We drifted off, talking about the gig. Did you see that twit trying to do the big apple? What about that bird with the big bristles? I must have had six doubles. Five pound core. Wish we could have more gigs like that. For Christ's sake, don't tell Martin he'll confiscate the money. Lovely piano. Here, you got lost in the middle eight of undecided. I don't know what happened. I thought I was playing hot and anxious. Gradually the talk faded. Silence. Night. But the time for Bexhill's siren was nigh. Somewhere in the wee-wee hours, a voice. Everyone on parade to the demo! The voice of Sergeant Dawson bellowed us awake. The local air raid sirens were going. At last, Bexhill had come into the war. Ta-da! In the dark, we stumbled into our clothes. Steel helmets, gas capes, and respirators on, roared a voice. Oh, Christ, said Devine. We're going to be bombed and gassed. Thank God, I couldn't stand this all again. Come on, urged Dawson. Don't fuck about. My Mickey Mouse watch said 3.30. Christ, 3.30! We were trooped into the naffy hut, faceless in gas masks, cocooned in gas capes, the epitome of military efficiency. Nobody knew who was who. What must have been the BSM held up the nominal roll board and was calling the names out when he realised he couldn't be heard. He raised the gas mask and started to recall the roll. We answered, but likewise, in turn, we couldn't be heard. Captain Martin, who'd had enough, took off his mask. Look, all take your masks off or we'll be here all bloody night. The roll was called. Right, gas mask on again. We all stood like dummies. We could hear no planes. Several minutes passed. BSM slipped his mask up. Stand at ease. We all stood at ease. Several more minutes passed. Leather suitcase arrived on the scene, looking flushed and pissed, with his pyjamas showing at the bottom of his trousers. For his benefit, the BSM called the roll again. There we stood. This was our first air raid warning. It became evident that, having roused us, nobody quite knew what to do with us. Sirens were going the length of the south coast. It's all Bixu's bloody fault, said Chalky. Eventually the eyepieces on suitcase's mask steamed up. He removed it and looked at his watch. Well, I, I think that's enough, don't you? Parade, dismiss, Sergeant Major. Parade, dismiss, and we all trooped off to bed. Application for RAF pilot. About now, of course, the heroes of the war were the RAF, pilots. It made you green with envy on leave. All the beautiful birds went out with pilots. I couldn't stand it any more. I volunteered for the Air Force. I had to be interviewed by Leather Suitcase. I hear you want to transfer, Milligan. Yes, sir, I, uh, I want to join the RAF. Ah, oh, yes, those are the ones that uh, fly. Yes, sir, they go up, whereas we go along. Have you ever flown before? No, sir. Uh, but I've been upstairs in a bus on my own. No, uh, what I said was, have you flown before? I, I didn't say anything about buses. Uh, no, sir, I have never flown before. Your father has written to me about it, and I will recommend you for a transfer. In February 1941, I was called for an interview at Kingsway House in High Holborn. I waited in a room with about 40 other hopefuls. 
After an hour, I was called before a man who appeared to be wearing a pair of hairy outstretched wings under his nose. I see you want to join the RAF. Yes, sir. I have the character and the temperament that is admirably suited to the arm. What would you like to be? A pilot, sir. You want to go out with pretty girls, eh? Ha, 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 ha. After a stringent physical examination, they told me, Sorry, your eyesight isn't up to what we need for a pilot. However, we have a large number of vacancies for rear gunners. No, sir, uh, I don't want to be at the back. I want to drive. I'm sorry, lad. That's all we can offer you. I stood up, saluted smartly, and exited. As I walked down the corridor to the street, I saw what was possibly the ugliest waff I had ever seen. Hello, cheeky, she said as I passed. Perhaps they were right. Perhaps I had got bad eyesight. I caught an evening train back to Bexhill and arrived to be informed by Edgington that he had read in the Melody Maker that Harry Parry of the BBC Radio Rhythm Club were holding auditions to find the best unknown jazz musicians. The winners were to make recordings for broadcasting on the BBC Home Service. We wrote off to Harry Parry, care of the BBC London, and we received a reply saying, could we come down on the next weekend? We approached Leather Suitcase. You're, you're, you're going to do what? Uh, do an audition for the BBC. You, you can't join them. They're, they're, they're shivvies. I explained as best as I could to him, bearing in mind that contemporary opinions of jazz in those days were almost the same as that of cannabis today. However, he let me go. And the following weekend, excited out of my mind, I arrived at the BBC studios made of ale. Briefly, I was picked as the best trumpet player, and along with the winning alto, trombone and tenor players, we cut a disc. The pianist for this was the then almost unknown George Shearing, and for an hour, along with Harry Parry, we recorded six sides. It was an unforgettable day for me. I felt that I had been accepted as a jazz man, and before I left, George Shearing said, I hope we meet and play again. Man, that was praise enough. Night of the Fire Aids The night of September the 7th, 1940, Harry and I went to the Playhouse Cinema in Western Road. It was dangerous moonlight, with Anton Walbrook, Terence Dimani, and that bloody awful Warsaw Concerto. When we came out that night, the sky was filled with what sounded like relays of German bombers heading inland. There was remarkably little ack to deter them. Cloud was low, and most of the anti-aircraft batteries were further inland, grouped around strategic cities. After a quick drink in the Devonshire, we ended up at the Forces Corner to finish off the evening. I started chatting up the birds, one especially, Betty Aspinall, a plain girl who made up for it with a sensational figure. Man had to be satisfied with his lot, and man, this girl had the lot. I tried to create an atmosphere of caviar and champagne while eating beans on toast with tea. The things soldiers do to impress girls. A gunner with a tremendous Welsh accent tried to make a girl believe that he was an American millionaire who had thrown in his lot with the British Army. He was heard to something to say like, Gee whiz, baby, ain't I lucky to have joined the little British old army, shucks? If I hadn't, I'd never have met you. Harry wandered up to the piano and started to play a few tunes. One of the WVS girls, who was serving, sidled up to the piano. She was the daughter of a retired admiral in Cooden Road. She was tall and beautiful, with a county school accent. Can you play foolish things? Harry complied. At first she only hummed the tune, then she started to sing. Christ! She sang a quarter of a turn flat the whole way through. I caught Harry's eye. He was suffering. Always a gentleman, Harry, at the end of her effort, said, Lovely. And courage, she said, Do you know a pair of silver wings? Harry did. At that moment, he wished he'd had a pair. He had to sit through some seven songs agonizingly sung before he escaped. She must have cloth ears, said Harry as we walked home. The bombers were still droning over. As we approached the billets, we could see a glow in the northern sky. The sound of distant ack ack could be heard. Someone's copying it, said the sentry as we walked into the drive. Looks like it could be Red Hill, said Harry. But I had my doubts. He was the only man I knew who would get lost in his own street. After the war, when I lived in Shepherd's Hill Highgate, he said he would show me a shortcut to his house in St. John's Way, Archway. We walked for an hour that night, during which time we'd never got more than 300 yards from my house. I can't understand it, he said. It's a magnetic north that must have changed during the war. Whatever that was supposed to mean, I'll never know. We climbed into bed. I've never heard so many bombers before, said Harry. We lay in bed smoking for about a quarter of an hour. Then Smudger Smith came in. Cool, he says. Look at the sky. It's on fire up there. 
We pulled on our trousers and climbed up onto the roof. The sky was on fire. Other gunners had joined us. We watched in silence for a while. I think it's London, said a cockney voice. Could be, said another. George Vincent went down for his prismatic compass. The bearing showed the fire dead on the line to London. Mick Hamer, a Londoner, tried to phone his family, but was told that there was disruption on the line and all calls to London were blocked. We looked at the blaze and it seemed to be getting bigger. I think we all knew it was London. My mother, father and brother were there. I'm not sure how I felt. Helpless, I suppose. Bombardier Edsa switched on the BBC Midnight News, but there was no mention of any raid. Lots of the lads from London, we were a London regiment, found it hard to sleep that night. In the dark of our bedrooms there were attempts at reassurance. But they've all got Anderson Shedders, aren't they? They're dead safe. Yeah, dead safe. And it's all our anti-aircraft gunfire. That keeps them up high. Yeah. Yeah, I aren't. And there's the underground. Nothing could break them. The window near my bed faced north. As I lay there, I could see the glow of the fires. The bombers were still going. Some must have been on the way back as we heard cannon fire as night fighters got into them. What a bloody mess. Men and bombers raining death on defenceless civilians. Still, soon, we'd be doing it back to them, on a scale never before imagined. For the love of me, I couldn't get the feeling that I was part of this. Killing of civilians was an outrage. I couldn't swallow on any basis on any side. But in the end, there were no sides, just living and dead. Next morning, we got confirmation of the raid. I managed to get through to my father at his office in Fleet Street, and he told me that all was well with the family. He was a fire warden on top of the Associated Press building and had seen the whole of what looked like St. Paul's on fire. The papers carried stories of how many German planes were shot down, heroism of the fire brigades, wardens, Red Cross and night fighters, etc., etc. But it didn't mention the casualties that were heavy. Well, heavy for that time of the war. Later on it appeared that London got off extremely light. Battery Characters Some people live a nothing life. The most important thing they ever do is die. Thank God for eccentrics. Take Gunner Octavian Neat. He would suddenly appear naked in the barrack room and say, Does anyone know a good tailor? Or oh, gentlemen, I think there's a thief in the battery. He was the bane of the regiment. When the fancy took him, he would go on the trot. I'm off sand ratting, he'd say. A month later, he'd give himself up, get 14 days detention and start all over again. Leather suitcase was baffled. Why should an Englishman in his right mind leave a perfectly good war? Look, Neat, why do you keep going AWOL? It's uh, something to do with a shortage of money, sir. Leather suitcase, as usual, gave him 14 days, and he was remanded for a psychiatrist's report. I don't like the uniform, Neat told the psychiatrist. What's wrong with it? It's dangerous. Germans shoot at it on sight. The report said there's nothing wrong with this man. He has a wholesome fear of being shot by Germans. Right, said Leather Suitcase, we'll put you where they can't get at you. Fifty-six days detention in Aldershot. Look, said Neat, hopefully, suppose not say sorry, sir. Very well, say it. I'm sorry, sir. Very, very sorry. They finished? Right. Fifty-six days detention, Aldershot. Neat stood tottering for a moment. May I have a last request, sir? Yes. Would you go to Beachhead and throw your bloody self off? This got him another fourteen days on top of the fifty-six. After this he was posted. Where to? The Tower Armoury. Gunner Herman Frick was a hypochondriac. He wanted out. He told the M.O., I've got the Redsby flat feet. After inspecting them, the M.O. gave him three aspirins, which is the army way of saying you're a bloody liar. The doctor's anti-Semitic, raged Frick. I'll prove my feet are flat. He smeared the soles of his feet with blue cream, then stood on a piece of paper. There, he said, holding up the print. Genuine flat feet. You're too bleeding fat, mate, said Gunner Not. It's all that weight that makes him look flat. Outraged, he replied, I'll show you it's not. And then stood on his head while two of us held up a board covered in paper which he pressed his feet against. At which moment the orderly officer entered the room. He stood silent before the strange tableau, muttered something to the duty sergeant, and left. Next morning, Gunner Frick was remanded for a psychiatric report, and part two orders bore this warning. An orderly officer has reported that certain black magic rituals are being practiced in the barrack rooms. This contravenes King's rules and regulations in that, within the structure of a regiment, no secret rituals or such organizations can be allowed except housey-housey. 
to my utter amazement, there was a man in the battery who had actually been with my father's regiment in Belgorm, India, in 1923. He said he remembered my father as the mad quarter bloke, which explained a lot. Busty Roberts had joined the artillery in 1914, and since then he had steadily risen to the rank of gunner. Now the crunch. Someone with a perverted sense of humour made him a lance bombardier. Roberts went insane with power. The war now consisted of two people, him and Hitler. His command of the language gave off some classic gaffes. It's in venereal to me, sir. And books. I like to read friction. He was the supreme bullshitter. He would sleep to attention, polish his cap badge on both sides. Cleaning his rifle one day, he pulled the trigger and sent a bullet to the roof. At once he put himself on a charge. Other than a firing squad, the CO didn't know what to do with him. Finally, he was posted. That's the act of being sent sideways. A night freak was Gunnar Lichtenstein. He suddenly sat bolt upright in bed and shouted, Oh, the goats! Then laid down again. Gunnar Spiv Convine would dip a sleeping man's hand in a bucket of cold water and make him whittle the bed. Then there was Lance Bombardier Dodds, who slept in the queue stall. He aspired to opera. His powerful voice not improved by singing a quarter of a tone flat, especially as he started after lights out. We decided to act. One night, as he lay singing, Your tiny hand is frozen, he must have heard the door open. Who is it, he said. Hurling a bucket of water, I replied, Puccini! The crude military life was terrible for our Jehovah's Witness, Bombardier MacDonald. Through all the vulgarity and the blasphemy, his voice would come out of the darkness. I tell ye, I'll repent. The day of judgment is at hand. Armageddon is nigh. Only they that believe will be saved. Piss off! Mock ye now, but hear me. When Jehovah cometh, ye will be stand to be judged. Bollocks! Despite these witty replies, he maintained a non-stop attack on military morals. Like most fanatics, he didn't enjoy religion, he suffered from it. Every weekend we'd find his pamphlets on our beds, and a terrible end they came to. But the pressure was too much, and gradually MacDonald became less and less religious. He started drinking and swearing. I tell ye, the body day is a hand. The end of the holy man came one revealing night. And it came to pass that Gunnar James Divide was on midnight guard when he was awakened by a rhythmic thumping from the back of the coal shed. Investigation showed Bombardier MacDonald, his trousers round his ankles, having a late-night knee trembler with a local fat girl. The noise was her head thumping against the shed as the holy man pressed home his watchtower. Gunnar Divine watched until the climax was nigh and then shouted out, Halt! Who comes there? The effect was electric. MacDonald ran into the night, clutching his trousers and shouting, Armageddon! I presume he meant Armageddon out of here. The girl, still in a sexual coma, was given Gunnar Devine's rifle to hold while he terminated her contract. Truly, they also serve who stand and wait. BSM Jumbo Day thought he would test the military reflex of the battery by sounding the six Gs on his bugle. The call demanded immediate muster by all ranks, but no one in this constricted army knew that. During the next fifteen minutes, alone in a dark field, the BSM blew the six Gs until he had fits, a hernia, and realised the age of the horse was over. He was knocked out in the early Montgomery purge. Anyhow, we had learned a lesson. We knew now what six Gs on the bugle meant. Hernia, fits, and your ticket. Gunnar Mossman. He'd get blind drunk, stagger back by 23.59 hours, feel his way into the barrack room, then urinate in a corner. One day a well-spoken recruit, Gunnar Lees, arrived. Do you mind if I sleep in this corner? Of course we didn't mind. Of course not. That night we heard the sound of Mossman streaming on the sleeping form of Gunnar Lees, a strange damp scream from the victim who was a mouth breather. Gunnar Lees bided his time. Next night, he returned the compliment full in the sleeping Norman's face. It wasn't long before part two orders read, the practice of urinating on sleeping comrades will cease forthwith. One bombardier, who shall remain a nameless bastard, had it in for all of us. Revenge was sweet. One night, he came in stoned out of his mind. We waited until unconsciousness set in. Removing his trousers, we carried him and his bed to a lorry. 
Driven with great stealth, he was deposited in the middle of Bexhill Cemetery. Next morning, he was delivered back to us by military policemen, wrapped in blankets and foaming at the mouth. Posting. Posting is an evil ritual. It was with devilish glee that one unit would pass on to another a soldier whom they knew to be bloody useless. However, to keep the joke going, these failures were never discharged, just posted. There must have been, at one time, thousands of these idiots, all in a state of permanent transit, spending most of their lives on lorries. Lots gave lorry numbers as their forwarding address. Hundreds spent the duration on board lorries. Seven were even buried on them. There is a legend that the last of these idiots was discovered as late as 1949, living on the tailboard of a burnt-out ammunition lorry in a wadi near Alamein. When located, he was naked, save for a vest and one sock, and he said he was waiting to be posted. <laughs> Monty. In 1941, a new power came onto the scene. Montgomery. He was put in charge of the Southern Command. He removed all the pink, fat-faced, hunting, shooting and fishing and chotapeg swilling officers who were sitting around waiting to see off the Bosch. To date, we'd done very little physical training. We had done a sort of a half-hearted knees-up Mother Brown for five minutes in the morning, followed by conducted coughing, but that's all. One morning, a chill of horror ran through the serried ranks. There, in part two orders, were the words... Oh, 0600 hours, the battery will assemble for a five-mile run. Strong gunners fell fainting to the floor. Some lay weeping on their beds. Five miles! There was no such distance. Five miles! That wasn't a run. That was deportation. On the fateful dawn, the duty bombardier bade us rise. Wiggy, wiggy, hands off cocks, on socks. The defenders of England rose wraith-like from their blankets, all silent, save those great lung-racking coughs that followed early morning cigarettes. The cough would start in silence. First there was the great inhale. The smoke sucked deep down into the lungs and held there while the victim started what was to be an agonized body spasm. The face would turn a sweaty lemon, the shoulders hunched, the back humped like a Brahmin bull, the legs would bend, the hand grabbed the thighs to support the coming convulsion. The cough would start somewhere down in the shins. The eyes would be screwed tight to prevent being jettisoned from the head. The mouth gripped tight to preserve the teeth. Suddenly, from afar came a rumbling like a hundred early Victorian water closets. Slowly the body would start to tremble and the bones to rattle. The first things to shake were the ankles. Then up the shins travelled the shakes, and next the knees would revolve and turn jelly form. From there up the thighs to the stomach it came, now heading for the blackened lungs. This was the stage when a sound like a three-ton girder being rolled over a corrugated iron roof was heard approaching the heaving chest. Following this up, the convulsed body was colour-patterned, from a delicate green at the ankles to layers of pinks, blue, varicose purple and sweaty red. As the cough rose up the inflated throat, the whole six colours were pushed up into the victim's face. It had now reached the inner mouth, the last line of defence. The cheeks were blown out the size of football bladders. The climax was nigh. The whole body was now a purple, shuddering mess. After several mammoths' attempt to contain the cough, the mouth would finally explode open. Loose teeth would fly out, bits of breakfast, and a terrible rasping noise filled the room with a terrible... <laughs> followed by a long, silent stream of spume-laden hair. On and on it went until the whole body was drained of oxygen, the eyes popping and veins like vines standing out of the head, which was now down twixt knees. The atrophied pose held for seconds. Finally, with a dying attempt, fresh air was sucked back into the body, just in time to do it all over again. Bear in mind, this was usually performed by some 60 men all at the same time. Whenever I see those bronze jet-set men whose passport to international smoking is a king size, I can't help but recall those bronchial dawn coughing wrecks. <laughs> PT. Physical training. So to the great run. Hundreds but hundreds of white shivering things were paraded outside Worthingholme. Officers out of uniform seemed stripped of all authority. Lieutenant Walker looked very like a bank clerk who couldn't. 
Now I, like many others, had no intention of running five miles. Oh no, oh no. We would hang back, fade into the background, find a quiet haystack, wait for the return, and rejoin them. Montgomery had thought of that too. We were all put on three-ton trucks and driven five miles into the country and dropped. So it started. Some, already exhausted by having to climb off the lorry, were begging for the coup de grace. Off we went, leather suitcase in front. In ten seconds dead, he was trailing at the back. Rest! Rest, he cried, collapsing in a ditch. We rested five minutes, and then he called, Right, follow me! Ten seconds, he collapsed again. <laughs> we left him expiring by the road. Many tried to husband their energy by running on one leg. It was too cold to walk. We had to keep moving, or hoarfrost got at the appendages. One by one, we arrived back at the billets. Behind was a five-mile train of broken men. It took two hours before the last of the stragglers arrived back. As a military disaster, the run was second only to Isolawana. It was the end of the line for leather suitcase. Our new commanding officer was Major Chaterjack, MC DSO. In the months that followed, he ran us across two-thirds of Sussex, the whole of the south coast, over mountains, through haystacks, along railway lines, up trees, down sewers, anywhere. If we ever had to retreat, we were in tip-top condition. In the first week, herds of men reported sick with sore feet. Busty Roberts, the old soldier, told us the cure. Piss in your boots, lad. Let them stand overnight. My God. It worked. Mind you, there were accidents. Forgetful sleepers got up and plunged their feet into boots full of cold urine. What an army! What a life! I still can't believe it happened. But of course, the Russians were advancing on all fronts. The Yanks were coming, and we had our first case of crabs. I had no idea what crabs was, or, as Smudger Smith said, the Sandy McNabs. The victim was Sergeant Cusack. He discovered he'd got them on the eve of a week's leave. The M.O. told him to apply Blue Unction. Now, Blue Unction has only one use, to destroy crabs. Knowing this, Sergeant Cusack entered Boots in Piccadilly with the prescription during the rush hour on Friday. It was crowded. He whispered to the assistant, Can I have some Blue Unction? In a voice that could be heard up Regent Street, the assistant said, Blue Unction! Cusack replied twice as loud, Yes! I've got bloody crabs! Do you hear me? I've got crabs! <laughs> Barrack Room Humour. Jokes. Pranks. What I'm about to relate is bawdy and vulgar, but as it's true, it stands on its own merits. It was after lights out that some of the most hysterical moments occurred. Those who had been drinking heavily soon made it known by great asphyxiating farts that rendered their owners unconscious and cleared the beds all around for fifty feet. There were even more gentlemen who performed feats with their unwanted nether winds, that not even the great Petermain could have eclipsed. Simply, they set fire to them. The artiste would bend down. His assistant stood by with a lighted match. When the artiste let off, he ignited it. Using this method, I have seen sheets of blue flame up to a foot in length. Old-timers, by conserving their fuel, could scorch a Tudor rose on the wall. There was Signaler X, whose control of the anal sphincter allowed him to pass Morse code messages. <laughs> With my own ears, I heard him sending SOS. On this occasion, I, like others, lay in bed, crying with laughter. But the most unbelievable act was Gunner Plunger Bailey, who did an entire 20-minute act with his genitals. It was done on a very professional basis. After lights out, a gunner would use a torch as a spotlight, which slit the artist's genitals. The third member of the act, Bill Hall, sang bird songs at eventide, as the star manipulated his genitals to resemble the following patterns. Sausage on a plate, the last turkey in the shop, sack of flour, the roaring of the lions, and by using spectacles, Groucho Marx. Finally, for the national anthem, he made the members stand. Each manipulation was received with a storm of clapping and cries of encore. Snoring. Each gunner had his own unique sound. Gunner Forrest's was like gargling with raw eggs through a gently revolving football rattle. 
For sheer noise, gunner knots. He vibrated knives, forks and spoons on the other side of the room. Before we went to sleep, we secured all the loose objects with weights. Sid Price gave off snores so vibrant, his bed travelled up to six inches a night. On bad nights, we'd find him out in the passage. Next, the teeth grinders. Gunner Leech's was like a, a dry cork twisting in the neck of a bottle, followed by the word, This next story was passed on from a subsection stationed at Alfriston. The gun crew were billeted in a beautiful old inn. The men were given the whole length of the attic. At one end was the great gun bucket that gunners place in their midst for use in inclement weather. It was worth its weight in gold, but there were what we call spoilers. These men, when the urine tub was full, would sneak up in the dark and silently relieve themselves thus caused spillage, and gradually, without their knowledge, the floor and the ceiling underneath were starting to rot. Came the terrible night when Lieutenant Seabag Montefiore, sleeping soundly below, was awakened by the sound of the ceiling falling through on him, followed by some twenty gallons of well-matured urine. There was a hell of a row. The landlord demanded compensation, etc. The ceilings were made good, and the gunners reprimanded, and it all blew over all except the smell. For months after, if you were downwind, you could always tell where Lieutenant Seabag Montefiore was. Moving to Millwood, 1941. During which the sole stratagem of the army in England was one of continual movement. They chose the most excruciating moments. After spending months making your billet comfortable, came the order, prepare to move. This time I was just about to lay my new axe minister when the order came in. It was awful. I had to sell the piano. The moves were always highly secret and came in highly sealed envelopes, the contents of which usually appeared in later editions of the Bexhill Observer. Secrecy was impossible. Enemy agents only had to follow the trail of illegitimate births. Another obsession was night occupation. The swearing the mighty oaths and clangs told the whole area exactly what was happening. It was quite normal for a pub to empty out and give a hand pulling the gun. Most kids in Bexhill could dismantle one. Our first move was to a specially selected, muddy, disused rubbish tip at Mill Wood, two miles from Worthingholm. The signal section, under Sergeant Dawson, had to start the lark of laying new lines. This was simple. You went from point A, the OP, and took the line to point B, the gun position. Taking a rough bearing, we set off carrying great revolving drums of D5 telephone cable. We had to cross railway lines, roads, swamps, rivers, with no more than adhesive tape. We borrowed the equipment en route from the houses. A ladder here, a pair of pliers there, a bit of string, a few hooks, a three-course lunch, etc., to cross roads, we had to climb telegraph poles, basically lazy. It took some half an hour of arguing and threats to get one of us to go up. It was always little Flash Gordon. He didn't want to climb the poles, but we hit him until he did. We had a new addition to the family, a military ten-line telephone exchange. This saved a great amount of cable laying. It also connected up the GPO. It was installed in a concrete air raid shelter at the back of Worthingholm. In 1962, I took a sentimental journey back to Bexhill. The shelter was overgrown with brambles. I pushed down the stairs, and by the light of a match, I saw the original telephone cable still in place on the wall where the exchange used to be. There was still a label on one. In faded lettering, it said, Galley Hill OP, in my handwriting. The place was full of ghosts. I had to get out. One of the pleasures of signal duty was listening to officers talking to their females. When we got a hot conversation, we plugged it straight through to the whole of the South Coast OPs. It was good to have friends. Camping At the new position, we were to live under canvas. It's very simple, said Sergeant Dawson. He was talking about the erection of a marquee. I've been camping a lot in my time, and I'll show you. Thirty signalers drove to the RAOC depot at Rygate in a three-ton truck. We were shown a great piece of rolled canvas, six foot by ten by five foot. From it hung numerous lengths of trailing ropes. In picking the thing up, it was impossible not to stand on them. We lifted. It must have weighed, ooh, 
three to four hundredweight, and it all seemed to be on my side. It was but a few yards to the truck, but somehow we found it impossible to get there. The lump was moved much in the same confused way that ants carry a twig. There was a fair bit of going round in a circle, three paces backwards, a little bit sideways, and lots of going round and round again. Straining around the edge were about twenty gunners, while underneath taking the weight on their heads were ten more. There was frequent swearing, unending strings of instructions, but progress none. The far side of the lump had started to unfold, so the carriers on that side were lost to sight and carrying blind. The whole thing was becoming absurd. The lump was coming to pieces as we continually trod on the trailing ropes. Those on the outside were getting tired, and the lump was getting lower and lower as the men underneath wilted. Finally, it collapsed with seventeen gunners underneath. The second attempt started. This time we just dragged the thing by its trailing edges and forced it into the lorry like stuffing a chicken. The lump now seemed much, much larger. We crawled on top of it and moved off. On arrival, we dragged what was now a long, uncontrolled canvas mess through the woods to the site. Sergeant Dawson was waiting. What in bloody hell have you done? The bombardier heart explained. We've, uh, we fucked it up, Sarge. We'll never win this bloody war, said Dawson, as he circled the canvas monster. Open it full length and try and fold it double on its side, he said. With a lot of twisting and untwirling, we finally got it like he wanted it on its side. Now, he said, where are the poles? A great hush fell on the multitude. Poles, Sarge? Poles? Poles? Yes, bloody poles. Ten of us were sent back for them. By careful planning, we returned in time to finish work for the day. Next morning, the nonsense continued. First, three men take the head of the pole each, right? Now crawl under the canvas towards where the roof is, right? Muffle cries of, <coughs> So far, so good. Now when you get to the roof seam, we'll prod the outside where there's a hole for the pole to go in. Muffled, <coughs> Underneath, the lumps, gunners Balfour, Gordon and White, made their way to the holes. Two made it, but the third lump stayed still. It was Flash Gordon. "'What's up now?' shouted Dawson. "'I've dropped me money,' said Flash. We stood idly by as the lump moved hither and thither, searching for the money. Finally, Dawson, patience exhausted, said, "'We can't wait. We're pulling the tent up, and you'll have to bloody well go with it.' We were all given a rope each. Eight men held the base of the two poles. All the header, heave! Marvellous! We got it up on one side and had it down on the other side on top of us. You bloody idiots! yelled Sergeant Dawson. All the time, Gunner Gordon's lump groped back and forth, swearing the air blue. It came to the point where the marquee was at least standing upright, but covered in mud with a dozen gaping holes. Now came the tent pegs. The hammering in passed without incident. But something looked wrong. Suddenly it dawned. You stupid pricks, said Dawson. The bloody thing's inside out. Well, let's sleep on the outside, I suggested. He hit me. The whole lunatic job started again. By sundown, the thing was up. Gunner White found Gordon's missing money. That night, we all drank Gunner Gordon's health. A mile away in the dark, Gordon, on his hands and knees, was searching the ground with a candle. Burning of the Clubs, Millwood it was during this time the goons in the Popeye cartoon appeared and tickled my sense of humour, and any soldier I thought was an idiot I called a goon. This was taken up by those with a like sense of humour. We called ourselves the clubbers. We built a club rack outside the marquee, and in time we fashioned great gnarled clubs from fallen branches. They all had names like uh, nukes, nut nourisher, instant lumps, and thud. The pride was a magnificent find by Gunner Devine, it was part of a blasted oak, five foot long, almost a replica of the Club of Hercules. We added to it by driving earthing irons into the head. It was solemnly christened Ye Crushed Modifier. The way the clubbers were assembled was by a trumpet call based on the fanfare from the boys from Syracuse. You should da 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 Immediately, the gang would do Hollywood rhubarb, rush forth, grab the clubs, run to the woods, hitting the trees and shouting, Death to the goons! Death to the goons! This exercise was our downfall. We were caught one summer's night by the duty officer. 
drunk and naked, we were running through the woods, wielding clubs and yelling, Viva la Joe Staline! We were ordered to destroy the weapons. We had a solemn funeral procession. They would have to be burnt in a warrior's grave. This turned out to be the disused rubbish tip at the bottom of a gently sloping hill. Rubbish was dumped by trucks via a small gauge railway. Filling the truck with clubs, we soaked them in petrol and then set them ablaze. Giving the truck a start, we jumped on, Edgington in front, holding on with arms stretched backwards, looking like a ship's figurehead. The truck gathered momentum, flames built up. We were gathering speed and singing, round and round went the bloody great wheel, when suddenly it occurred to me there was no method of braking. As we careered towards a mountain of old tins, crying with laughter, I shouted, Jump for it! We all leaped clear, save Edgington, who seemed transfixed. At the very last minute, he let out a strangled castrati scream and hurled himself sideways as the blazing truck buried itself into the mountain of tins with an ear-splitting crash. It was a fitting end for the sacred clubs. Occasions of insanity such as this stopped us all going mad. The gun position telephone at Millwood was in a small wooden hut, nine foot by eight, some two hundred yards from the gun. We were fairly isolated, off the road, and in what had been the sand quarry. The hut backed onto the working face of a sandy cliff about fifteen feet high. Around and above grew gorse and brambles. It was a perfect getaway place, so much so that I used to volunteer to do any other signaler's duty. It was simple. You sat by a phone and every hour tested the line to the battery exchange. Twice a day, we'd take down something called a MET, M-E-T. These were figures that I didn't understand. It's all to do with temperatures and barometric pressures. The GPOA, or specialists, as we say, would work out from a book of tables what effects this information had upon the fusing of the shells and ranging. It was all too much for me. A week's duty in the hut all centred around a gramophone lent by Nick Carter and Jazz Records. Happiness was a mug of tea, a cigarette and a record of Bunny Berrigan playing Let's Do It. Sharing it with friends like Harry rounded off the occasion. What's happened to us all since then? The world's gone sour. Happiness is a yesterday thing. Ablutions were primitive. We crossed the road into Bexhill Cemetery. By the grave of a Mrs. K. Loughborough, died 23rd September 1899, not dead, just sleeping, was a tap. That was it. There are few finer sights than a duty signaller scrubbing his dirty underwear on a marble slab of Mrs. Loughborough's last resting place. Dead, not sleeping, said Chalky White as he read her inscription. She's not kidding anybody but a bloody self, he said as he wrung his socks out on her. In the evening after dark, one or two of our favourite birds would visit us and bring fish and chips. Once in, we bolted the door. As the days of 1940 came to an end, Dunkirk was sliding into history. The war was spreading. There seemed very little in the way of victories. There were constant reversals in Libya and Greece. On my birthday, the 16th of April, 1941, London had its worst raid yet. But cheering news! May the 14th was the anniversary of, wait for it, the Home Guard. In billets again. After a winter under canvas, it was good news that we were to be billeted in Turkey Road Girls' School. It was for us a paradise. Large, clean rooms, white walls, ideal for nails, parquet floors, a large ballroom, showers, a well-equipped gymnasium, which we pretended not to see, and finally a brand new upright piano on which Harry could play that bloody awful Warsaw Concerto. From here we ran our own dances. Captain Martin registered 19 Battery as a limited company and sold shares to sister regiments. At this new billet we received morning visits from a WVS canteen van. A very dolly married woman took a fancy to me, and one night after a dance she took me home. Strange aftermath. A week later I thumbed a lift to Eastbourne, a civvy car. This man gave me a lift. Inside I could smell her perfume. My wife works for the WVS, said the driver. Oh, really? I said. It was all sex in those days. It was that or the flicks, and flicks cost money. There was a lovely busty bird called Beryl, who had hot pants for me. During the interval of our first dance at Turkey Road School, I took her to a lorry park in the back of a 1,500-weight truck. We were going through our third encore when the truck drove off. Apart from the jolting, it must have been the best ride we've ever had. It stopped at Hastings. Through the flap, I saw our chauffeur was Sergeant Boner Hughes, who hated my guts. 
I don't know why, he'd never seen them. He backed the truck up an alley and left it while he went into the White Lion for a drink with his bird, who was a barmaid. Slipping into the driving seat, I drove it back and arrived in time to play the second half of the dance. Where the bloody hell have you been? asked Eddington, sweating at the piano. I, Harry, have been having it off in the back of a lorry, and I got carried away. Ha <laughs> 7.2 guns and the tiger scheme. Our 9.2 guns were past it. Every time they fired, bits fell off. In place of bolts and nuts, we bent nails and chicken wire. Gunners on leave would rummage to their sheds for screws, pinions, etc. The end came when elastic bands which held the gun side together were no longer obtainable. The Major wrote away asking for a new gun for Christmas. One day they arrived. Dozens of them. 7.2 gun howitzers. Huge things towed behind giant scammel lorries. At once we were put into vigorous training to familiarise ourselves with the new toys. For weeks the area rang to the clang of breech blocks, shouted orders, grunts of the sweating ammunition numbers. The guns threw a 280-pound projectile 17,800 yards, so you weren't safe anywhere except at 18,000 yards. Momentum was mounting. We were getting new field telephones, wireless trucks, wireless sets, tannoy loudspeakers that linked command posts to the guns. The war effort was moving into top gear. Monty sprang a giant Southern Command scheme, codenamed Tiger. One autumn dawn, the sky was a mass of grey sponges. This, undoubtedly, would be the day. It was. Off we went. One hour after off we went, we stopped winting. We were in the middle of a rainforest that appeared to be in the Mato Grosso. Dismount, came the waterlogged order. Soggy officers were called to the O.C.'s car. They stood in a squelching semicircle holding maps. Chatterjack whipped through the map references and all that khaki jazz. Our officer was Tony Goldsmith. We've got to set up an OP at map reference uh, 8975 somewhere on the South Downs. Synchronised watches. None of us had one. Very well, said uh, Goldsmith. I'll synchronise my watch. Goldsmith's map reading left something to be desired, like someone to read it for him. Using his method, we arrived at a hundred-year-old deserted chalk quarry. How can people be so heartless as to desert a hundred-year-old chalk quarry? We were just two hundred feet above sea level. We got out. Goldsmith consulted his map. There must be something wrong, he said, looking intelligent at two hundred feet below sea level. According to my calculations, we should be on top of a hill looking down a valley. Gunner Milligan said, but we aren't on top of a hill looking down a valley, are we, sir? No, I'm not, Milligan. How shrewd of you to notice. This could mean promotion for you or death. I suggest we retrace our steps to the main road. Does anyone know where it is? I think I do, sir, said Diver Wenham. We boarded the truck and set off somewhere. Uh, send a message to HQ, said Goldsmith, still trying to maintain the illusion of efficiency. Uh, say, uh, truck and ditch will be late for OP. I sent off the message, but received a request for Goldsmith to speak to Sunray, code name for the CEO. What a lovely name, I thought, for a dripping wet CEO. Sunray. Goldsmith spoke. Hello, Sunray. Seagull here. Over. Back in the reply. What the bloody hell's going on? Over. Goldsmith. The truck's stuck, sir. Over. Chatter Jack. Well, hurry up. The whole bloody battery's waiting for you. We drove grimly on. One o'clock. Get the BBC News, Milligan, said Goldsmith. You never know. It might be all over. There were the opening bars of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. I wonder if he gets royalties, said Goldsmith. Oh, yes, I said, every Friday. The news. Russians were advancing on all fronts. Then a list of current British disasters, like retreats, sinkings, etc. The news concluded with a report of a two-headed calf born in Hereford. Using all the skill of a trained army driver, Wenham had the truck in a ditch a second time. Uh, sorry, sir, said Wenham. I won't do it again. Oh, don't stop now, man. You're just getting the hang of it, said Goldsmith. Milligan, send another message. Truck now in second ditch. Back came Chatterjack. Chatterjack. Good God, Tony. Where are you, man? Over. About a mile from the OP, sir. Over. You're very faint. Over. It's the food, sir. Over. I can't hear you. Look, we'll have to write, write you off. We'll get 18 battery OP to fire. All right. Over. Uh, Roger, sir. Anything else? Over. A two-headed calf has been born at Harryford, sir. Two what? Over. Very good, sir. Anything else? No, Roger and out. 
We stopped at a village of Lower Lind, where we went to the Isolde Bioscope Cinema to see Dangerous Moonlight with Anton Warbrook and heard that bloody awful Warsaw Concerto. Lieutenant Goldsmith paid for us all, as is fitting for a man wearing a king's uniform over his Queen's College body. He told me a story about uh, Jesus College, Cambridge. It was Christmas morning. The phone rang in the gate porter's lodge. Hello, said the porter. Is that Jesus? said a donish voice. Yes. And the voice sang, Happy birthday to you. At six o'clock we arrived at the night rendezvous, a field of bracken resting on a lake. We got tea from a swearing cooker screw who took it in turns to say piss off to us. We were given to understand we could have a complete night's sleep. Good. We tossed for who was to sleep in the truck. I lost. Sod. Rain. Idea. Under truck, Milligan. Laid out ground sheet, rolled myself like a casserole in three blankets, and dropped into a deep sleep. I awoke to rain falling on me. The truck had gone. Everybody had gone. There had been a surprise call to action at 0200 hours. I was alone in the fifty-acre field. I shouted into the darkness, Anybody there? I was still alone in the fifty-acre field. I smelt of oil. I felt my face. It was smothered. The stuff had dripped from a leaky sump. Sound of a motorbike approaching. Help, I said. Who's that, said a voice. It was Geordie Dawson. It's me, Sarge, Milligan. A torch shone. What in Christ's happened to you, he said. I'm doing four ropes and impressions. You're just in time for my encore. I started to sing, Old man Reba, that old man you. What's that on your mush? It's oil, Sarge. I cut an artery and I, I struck oil. Well, Rich, do you hear me? We can be married. He started to laugh. You silly bugger. We've half the bloody signal section looking for you. The scheme's over. I know, I said. Half of it's over me. Come on, I'll take you back. Go back, I said in a pain voice, but I am happy here on the old plantation, Master Boss. Seated on the pillion, he drove me back to Bexhill. Tiger had been a roaring success. The German high command must have been ecstatic. The following is an excerpt from the regimental's war diary of the time. When the weather was too bad for schemes out of doors, wireless and telephone exercises were held within the regiment to increase their proficiency in communications. It was on such an occasion as this that a message reading, Invasion Fleet in Channel, two miles off Seaford, steaming northwest, established strength, three capital ships, sixteen destroyers, and many lesser craft. He had omitted to prefix the message with the magic word, Practice and by some unkind trick of fate, which has never since been accounted for, the message bypassed RHQ and was sent direct to Corps. The scheme finished and the regiment prepared to depart on its nightly occupations. Suddenly, the peace was shattered by the frantic ringing of telephone bells. It was a call from War Office who inquired, in no uncertain tones, what the thundering blazes was the meaning of our message, what steps had been taken by us and had the Navy been informed. By the time the matter had been sorted out, tempers were frayed and feelings were running high. It took some laughing off, but a personal visit by the CEO to the War Office the following day succeeded in allaying the storm. It was an interview that few of us would have cared to have undertaken personally. I think I can now safely reveal the signal was sent by 954024 Gunner Milligan. <laughs> Sports Invitations to join the battery boxing team had fallen flat. We had one professional, Sergeant Conroy, but he wasn't going to do any boxing. Oh, no. He was, to quote him, going to pluck another Jimmy Wilde from our ranks. He plucked Lofty Andrews, a beanpole, six foot one, with a pigeon chest. Conroy explained, This lad is God's gift to me. He's as tall as a heavyweight, with the same reach, and he's only weighs eight stone. Now, boxers at that weight are usually only, oh, five foot six, don't you see? With Lofty's reach, they won't get near him. But before that, the battery were to have another champion. Southern Command sports were coming up. One of the competitors was Gun Alexandra Nays, who had entered for the high jump. This puzzled us. He was the most unathletic person I'd ever met. Such was his confidence, he never trained. Came the day, and Bexhill's sports ground was crammed with shouting soldiers and things. The weather was perfect, sunny, warm, with a delightful, cool, salt-scented breeze from the channel. The grass was fresh-cut green. How can people have wars? 
Among the contestants were professional athletes from pre-service days. Some Canadian high jumpers were clearing the bar at five foot eight just as a warm-up. To date, no sound or sight of Gunanais. Then we saw it. Issuing from under the stands was a figure. He was wearing a red hooped loose football jersey, elastic waisted blue military PT shorts that reached well below the knee, grey army socks dangling around his ankles, and white slightly overlarge plimsolls. He ran in a series of peculiar little bounds and leaps, flicking his feet behind him, which I thought was some sort of expertise muscle loosening exercise. He was blissfully unaware of the comparison his comic garb made with his sleek muscled professional clad opponents. By then he arrived at the jump off. The warming up had been terminated. The official had taken down the bar and temporarily rested it at three foot. Nays eyed it. He walked some hundred yards from the bar, then turned and started to run. It wasn't until he was halfway that we realized he intended to jump. He gathered a sort of lumbering momentum, but never got faster. Finally, reaching his goal, he launched himself into a sort of schoolboy, double your legs under you style jump, and just managed to clear it. He seemed well pleased, unconscious of the puzzled look that followed his effort. Came time for the jump off. An official signaled Nays and asked him if he was competing. Nays nodded. Nays walked back twenty yards, turned, and now saw that the officials had set the bar at five feet. For the first time, he looked worried. He walked back a further fifty yards. He started his approach. The stadium fell quiet as the great athlete had bounded across the grass. We all felt that something unusual was about to happen. On and on he came, making little clenching gestures with his hands. He reached the bar and with a triumphant shout of Hoi, hoi, hapla, and an almighty effort, he hurled himself upwards. The bar broke across his forehead. Cheering broke out from the stands. Gunanese kept running. He left the field. He left the stadium. He left athletics. Our next hope of a champion was the as yet untested Lofty Andrews. Twenty elimination bouts. Proceed to the Army Benevolent Fund. Seat sixpence, two and six, three shillings and five shillings. The notice was pinned below the ticket office window in the foyer of the Delaware Pavilion. Hurry along. First fight starts in five minutes. Minutes five, said Sergeant Balcon in his best voice. He was a strange-looking fellow, his eyes very close together, his nose and ears so large they appeared to be trying to outgrow each other. He spoke with that sound peculiar to the cockney larynx when he tries to speak posh. To obtain this metallic sound, you press the chin down onto the throat, apply slight pressure to the Adam's apple, you press the lips, the lower ones slightly protruding, tense the tongue, lay it flat in the well between the lower teeth and say, ee, ee. Troops were rolling in. I sat thirty rows back between Gunners Devine and White, Devine being no mean brawler himself. Why aren't you fighting tonight, Devine? asked Captain Martin. Oh, they won't let you use your head, sir, said Devine, going through the motions of nutting an opponent. The hall was packed, and a great carillion of voices filled the ear. Cigarette smoke wafted upwards from two thousand throats and hung like a pall in the still air. Old scores were being settled, with balls of paper flicked at the backs of unsuspecting NCOs' necks. Men were standing, shouting to men in other rows. Bombardier Rossi was taking bets in the tense region of two shillings. The last of the officers were sauntering in, flushed with hurried whiskies. They were greeted with cheers or raspberries, according to their popularity rating. Now came guest of honour, Lieutenant Colonel Harding. No sooner had he sat down, when came the national anthem, and very strangely... It was being played by Gunner Edgington on a piano from the stage behind a vast heavy velvet curtain that acted as a baffle. As the first tinklings of the anthem permeated the babble, it was a rare sight to see two thousand soldiers in various stages of patriotic uncertainty. Those nearest could hear and were at attention. Those in the middle were somewhere between sitting and hovering in the half-upright, while those farthest away heard nothing and sat looking puzzled at the confusion around them. What's going on? Stand up! It's the national anthem. I can't hear it. It's beyond the curtain. What's beyond the curtain? The national fucking anthem, that's what. To try and weld the confused mass into one coherent whole, Colonel Harding started to sing, Send him victorious, happy, etc., etc. He was joined by a few promotion-seeking officers. 
At the end, the small band of brave singers were given a tremendous ovation with shouts of encore enriched with farts. Eddington, thinking the applause was for him, appeared grinning through the curtain, a waste of time, as the house lights went off, blacking him out. The ring now stood candescent in the floods, the light bouncing off the taut white ropes. Two miserable-looking boxers sat in their corners with towels draped over their shoulders. R.S.M. Warburton scrubbed, gleaming in crisp S.D., tight at the neck, climbed into the canvas area. His hair greased, glistening in the lights, his buttons flashing. Referring to a card, he spoke in a voice like prodding minutes. Bellouts, ladies and gentlemen. A voice from the dark shouted, Go home, you Welsh bullshitter. Warburton machine-gunned the crowd with his eyes. Gentlemen, please. The first fight of your programme is flyweight contest to three three-minute rounds. At the weigh-in, Reynolds in the red corner weighed eight stone two pounds. Give the poor sod some grab. Gentlemen, please. The RSM versus the rest continued until Warburton left the ring. The first three fights went through their thudding, sweating, grunting course. The animal in the crowd had been released and tension lessened. Now came the bout we had come to see. In the red corner, from D battery, 56, 5, 6, uh, heavy regiment, Royal Artillery, Gunner Andrews. We cheered as Lofty stood. But the sight of his skinny body with shoulder blades protruding from his back like wings didn't look very promising. At the sight of him, Bombardier Rossi's odds changed dramatically. He refused to take bets. In the opposite corner sat a red thing called Rifleman G. Motts. He was five foot six, covered in muscles, hair, scars, and tattoos of snakes disappearing into every orifice. Under Neolithic brows, two evil black eyes stared out from hair which grew onto his forehead. There was no neck, the head seemingly joined to the shoulders by the lobes of his ears. At the first sight of this creature, Lofty tried to scramble out of the ring. I'm not fighting that until I hear it talk, said Lofty. Oh, don't let appearances fool you, Smooth Conroy. They haven't, said Lofty. Second out, first round. The two grossly ill-matched contestants approached each other. The Bexel air raid sirens went. Lofty, a nervous lad, immediately took cover laying face downwards on the canvas. The referee was puzzled. You all right, lad? He said to the figure of the canvas. Yes. Then you'll have to stand up, or I'll start counting you out. Lofty looked to Conroy for professional advice. He got it. Get up, you silly cunt. The remark was lost in the booing and the jeering in true British sporting fashion. Lofty rose. The fight continued. Another disaster. The lights fused. More uproar and whistling. The lights went on. The referee was unconscious on the canvas. Lofty went to pick him up. Motts, seizing the opportunity, let go with a haymaker that connected with Lofty's cheek and down he went. The bell went. Conroy dragged Lofty to his corner. R.S.M. Warburton dragged the referee out of the ring. The lights went out again. The bell for the second round. Someone in Mott's corner stuck a match. The lights went out again. Lofty was sitting on his stool and was crying. The rotten sun hit me when I wasn't looking, he sobbed. Conroy threw in the towel and Lofty joined Nays in retirement. It wasn't the end. Lofty waited outside and when Mott's appeared, kicked him in the cobblers, then ran. I suppose you'd call it a draw. Next, rugby. Sergeant Griffiths fished around for players, rather volunteers. In a hammerlock, I admitted I'd played standoff for my convent. Using threats, he got together a scratch team. Our opponents were the Sussex Regiment. As they took the field, an uneasy feeling went through me. Each one was six foot and fourteen stone. It transpired that they were ex-convicts, who were given remission provided they joined the army. And now, we were going to pay for it. We won the toss, but that's all. Griffiths kicked off. It was the last legitimate move of the game. From then on, it was a massacre. In the terrible scrums, our hooker had his ears reduced to red flaps. In the rucks, our shins were kicked black. In the loose, they tackled anyone, even each other. Their handoffs were like walking into steel girders. The field rang to our screams. By half-time, we were fifteen gibbering things, running white with fear and hiding on the crossbar. Milligan, come down at once, you cowardly bugger, said Griff. They're not human, Sarge, whined sixteen-tone tiny vickers. I've got a wife and kids to think of. Right, I'll think of them while you're playing, said Griff. The second half saw the end. In a moment of insanity, one of us had got the ball and was immediately crushed to the ground under six hundred weight of steaming beef. The brute I'd pounced on shot back his elbows, catching me flush under each eye. When I came to, I was laying in a shallow, muddy grave. I looked up. Play was at the far end and was coming my way. For Christ's sake, don't get up, shouted Griffin, or you'll put us all offside. I waited no more. I ran for my life. 
I hid under the stands. I never played again. Nobody should play rugby. Rugby is just for watching. February 1941. Move from Turkey Road School to Hailsham. One Sunday morning, we Roman Catholics were religiously gathered around playing pontoon. A devout Scottish gunner was about to say pontoons only when Bombardier Bass had entered. Stop, he said. The Scots gunner, with a twenty-one hand and therefore heir to a fortune, collapsed. Bastard spoke the well-known phrase, Prepare to move. Kit packed by 0600s. Parade 0615. Full FSMO. We were off again. Yes, lads, said Bastard through clenched teeth. We're all going tatars. He then detailed Edgington and myself to clean up the officer's billet at Trevisic. You will report back to billets before 1500 hours. Understand? We understand. We put on our denims and with two brooms grumble our way to Trevisic, a house in the posh area of Bexel, known as the Highlands. We picked up bits of paper, rusty blades, a sock, a broken record of Al Bali singing, Buddy, can you spare a dime? He's broke, I punned. Ha ha ha! Somebody had to laugh at them. We burnt all the rubbish and the brooms. Then a bit of old Irish luck, Jesus there was. There in the corner of the garage was a crate of certain bottles. We drew nigh, and lo, there were two bottles full of liquid, one marked Barbados rum and the other soda water. Being of a patriotic mien, I volunteered to taste the rum in case it was poisoned. I can't let you take all the risks, said Harry. I must drink my share. The tasting went on for quite a while. Also being of a scientific mind, from time to time we mixed the soda with the rum. We gave of our best for over an hour. At twelve hundred we were wandering, drinking, giggling, somewhere in Millwood. I challenged Edgington to a tree-climbing race. He said, I couldn't climb a tree for Chuffy. And I said, who climbs trees for Chuffy? I'll get mine in the shop. At thirteen hundred hours we were still wandering, drinking and giggling in a tree in Millwood. I said I could leap from the tree and say... My mum's monkey makes many mistakes before I hit the ground. He said rubbish. He would never get further than mum's monkey. But he could. I jumped but forgot to say it. He said it but forgot to jump. So he jumped while I said it. The sun was setting and an early crescent moon sailed towards the evening sky. Gunner Edgerton lay on his back looking up at the neck of an empty bottle. All gone, he said. Gone. All gone. I said from the same position. We both stood up. He saluted and fell down. I did an imitation of last post over his recumbent body. England's a beautiful country, he said, and was sick. I don't know how, but we ended up at the house of a lady friend, a pretty girl with hairy legs, who was getting married next week. We sat and listened to her play Chopin. I sang, Chopin, I love you. You know I always will. I, I love most of your nocturnes, and I'd sing them till I'm ill. Lovely, she's lovely, she's absolutely lovely. We arrived back at Turkey Road in the dying moments of the battery's departure. Great activity. We hoisted long underwear up on the flagpole. We joined a queue going into the queue stores and came out with a case of prunes each. A duty bombardier, insane with military rage, put us under arrest for being late, drunk, improperly dressed, cheeky NCO, bad language, the murder of Rasputin, and singing the Warsaw Concerto. Get your kit on that fucking truck. Piling onto that fucking truck, we drove into the night towards yet another unknown destination. We lay on heaps of military guns and sang the worst American song titles we could dream up. Galloping hooves in the night remind me I married a centaur. Little Dutch time bomb, tick, tick, boom. I'll wait for you till the end of time and then apply for an extension. We were whistling the Warsaw Concerto when the lorry stopped. We'd arrived. In the dark, Harry and I unloaded our kit. The lorry drove away. He'd only stopped for a leak. We stood on the verge swearing. We sat on the verge swearing, which is the same as standing, only lower down. We put our ground sheets down, covered up with blankets, and went to sleep swearing. In the wee hours, the truck returned. You silly buggers, said the driver. What did you get off for? Excitement, said Harry. An hour later, we were dumped in the yard of a requisitioned livery stable come dog breeder's kennels at the junction of the A295 and A22. That's the Hailsham Eastbourne Road. Up in loft, that's where lads are sleeping, said Bombardier. We climbed up and were met with a steamy fog that goes with sleeping gunners. Phew. It was 5.30 a.m., so there was no point in sleeping. We started to change into dry clothes. A perfect end to the whole night was nigh. I fell through the bloody trapdoor. Edgington looked down from above. Cheer up, he said. Remember, man with the death's watch beetle in wooden leg... 
much better off than man with tin leg and thunderstorm. I made a certain gesture. Our new HQ was Hailsham. In the town centre, an old vicarage was commandeered as a battery office. It was a maze of unending passages and dark brown rooms. I remember Lieutenant Walker, drunk, at two one morning, blundering through the darkened corridors, shouting, Ariadne! The thread, Ariadne! The thread! Normal day, Revali 0630, roll call 0700, breakfast 0715, parade 0800, then training, Morse code, heliograph, wireless, jokes, tea, break at 10.30 when a naffy van arrived, parade 11 again. More training. I was the clown of the battery. I would give a demonstration of how to do rifle drill in Braille, how to sleep standing up on guard, how to teach a bat rest to beg, how to march standing still. Roll call one morning. Neat. Ta. Edgerton. Ta. Milligan. Milligan. Gunner Milligan. Ta. Why didn't you answer the first time? I thought I'd bring a little tension into your life, Sarge. Oh. Well, here's a little tension for you. Danger! To the cookhouse for fatigues! Quick march! Fight at Robin's Post in Hailsham. The battery telephone exchange was in the grounds of Robin's Post, a private home on the A22 between Horsefield and Polgate. Again, it was an air raid shelter but brand new, with shelves, wall beds, ventilation, and plenty of electric points and lights. We were well away from everybody. Occasionally, we'd get a visit from Lieutenant Goldsmith. During spells of duty, we would make up what I suppose were the first dim adumbrations of the goon show. Here's a fragment of Harry Edgerton's writing of that time. The door flew open, and in crashed the master spy himself. Grunt and farts. Measuring five rounds gunfire by inches three, and clad in only a huge fur coat of huge fur, a sou'wester, and two hand-painted barges strapped to his feet for a quick getaway, with a hairy on the knee. He was escorted by a plague of zeppelins. He loped across the room with a great lope, and snatching up a sharpened lamppost, hurled it wildly at the bedraggled portrait of Sir Benison of Duwaka. So perish all enemies, he roared, and then I have quoth, whereupon they all leapt into a handy bus and drove off smiling and waving to the wildly cheering populace. A near thing, he said, reaching for the wine. That lamppost must have been seven and one tooth. Curtain to cord in various flats by orchestra of military bugle, violin, and pianist, who had one hand out to show he was going to turn right. We wrote reams of this stuff. We read it to Lieutenant Goldsmith. Very good, he said, moving in the general direction of a way. The signal section was a law unto itself. We organized the duty roster to suit ourselves. We all opted for one week's duty and one off. Two of you would work out who slept and who kept awake. During the off week, your presence in bed at midday was explained thus. This man has been on duty all night, sir. It was all right having a whole week off, but it became boring. A sleeping contest was inaugurated. The rules were, the contestant will at no time leave the bed. The first to do so is disqualified. So started the great sleep. Piddles were done out of the back window at night, standing on your bed. Food was hauled up in a kit bag when the naffy van called at 10.30 of a morning. Tea was brought in by bribing jankawallers. The contestants were Gunners Milligan, Edgington, White and Devine. There we lay for five days and nights. Sometimes we sang songs, told jokes, recounted past incidents. You know what I'd like to do to Bombardier Jones? What? Tie to post, then shoot him with a blunderbuss loaded with his own shit. When I leave the army, I'm not going to do anything for a year. You know what I'd like now? Four fried eggs, chips, bacon and tomatoes. Uh, too many eggs give you the yawn. I think this war will die out. Die out? What do you mean? Well, stop. I mean, everyone will get fed up. I'm fed up already. So am I. Let's all fuck off. Then there's a fag. All this scrounging bloody fags. What do you do with them? And I smoke them. Edgington won the contest with six days and seven hours. Christ, how did you do it, said Devine. Training, said Edgington. That and dreams of grandeur. About now, the owner of the livery stables, retired livery colonel, gave a dance for the officers from local British and Canadian units. We were detailed to play for the dancing. British officers are possibly the world's worst ballroom dancers. One or two of the more daring ones would wag one finger in the air as they went trucking on down. First signs of repressed inhibitions came in the Paul Jones. As they circled the ladies, they would do a few jolly Scottish whoops. Next, they would do what I call the cocking of the legs which I will describe later. 
The dance was held at Robin's Post, in a large and comfortable country-style lounge. Chairs and sofas clad in loose floral covers, plenty of polished wood, a few Hercules brabbers and brabbers and watercolours on the walls, standard lamps with silk shades, a few oriental curios, traces of visits to foreign climes. What are foreign climes? Waiter, a pound of foreign climes, please. As the guests eased themselves in, we were playing lively tunes. Woodchopper's Ball, Don't Sit Under the Apple Tree, Mara Monsieur Apple Pie, Honeysuckle Rose, Undecided, Tangerines. What memories these tunes bring back. Soon the floor was crowded. Drinks for the band were arriving at a steady rate. Major Chatterjack, MC DSO, came over to see that we were being looked after. He really was a great soldier. I, for one, would have followed him anywhere, preferably away from the war. He was this kind of man. An autumn morning. The early sun had melted the night frost, leaving glistening damp trees. The battery parading. Small wafts of steam were appearing from men's mouths and nostrils. A muster roll is called. BSM is about to report to Major Chatterjack. Battery all correct in prison, sir. The roar of a plane mixed with cannon shells all over the place. An ME 109 rooftop, red propeller boss, panic. Battery is one man into the ditch. Not Major Chatterjack, MCDSO. Stands alone in the road, unmoved, produces a silver cigarette case, and lights up a cigarette. He is smoking luxuriously as we all sheepishly rise from what was now feels like the gutter. He addresses us. Very good. You realise what you did was the right thing and I the wrong. What can you say to a bloke like that? Interval time at the dance. We ditch our instruments and wander into the garden for a leak. Finding a bush, we ease springs. These were accompanied by the usual Poston blasts. Each one greeted with cries of good luck, fall out the officers, drink up, or mine's a Guinness. As I became accustomed to the dark, I was horrified. But five feet from us in a garden seat was Lieutenant Goldsmith and a lady. As we slunk away, he called out, Thank you, gentlemen, and what time is the next performance? This was too much. We broke into uncontrollable laughter, and once started, we couldn't stop. The time we got to the house, I was holding my sides with pain. On entering, we saw a huge, fat woman seated at the drums, making a bloody fool of herself. This finished me off. The dance restarted. Without warning, a Canadian officer poured a beer into the bell on my saxophone. Yes, I also played that. Which he thought was funny. I threw the contents on his jacket, something that he didn't think was funny. He grabbed the saxophone, and I stopped playing. Let go, I said. This is a solo instrument. Our host came over. The Canadian was told it wasn't the done thing. The dance continued, and we, rather I, got drunker. Time now for what I told you was the leg cocking. This is an English officer's gyration. The man assumes the position for a highland reel, and then at the sound of a 2-4 or 6-8 tempo, he raises his right leg and leaps all over the room with one hand up in the air and one on his hip. We played Highland Laddie, and at once the floor became a mass of leaping twits, all yelling and leaping in unison. OK, they screamed. This is where the fight started. One of the batmen serving drinks had his tray knocked flying all over a Mrs. Hendricks. Captain Hendricks hit someone. Someone else hit him. This became popular. The room became a melee of fisticuffs and gentlemen. Somebody stopped them, shrieked Mrs. Hendricks, as somebody floored her. Our host rushed up. Quick, play a waltz. We launched into Moonlight Madonna. Someone hit Major Chatterjack, MCDSO. His batman laid out the offender, then carried Major Chatterjack, MCDSO, to safety. To help it all along, Doug Kidgel threw an occasional cream cake into the arena. The addition of confectionery to the struggling mass made exotic pictures. A red-faced major, his bawling head supporting a chocolate eclair, hit a Canadian sporting a jam-covered ear. Kidgel's masterpiece was a large circular cream top cake that struck the back of a long officer's head. For moments he stood like Greco's Christ ascending until a loping right felled him. The cake was picked up by a foot which trotted all over a chest, then passed it on to a neck. In a short time, cream, jam and treacle were liberally distributed on the uniforms of His Majesty's officers. Strawberry flan up the front of the jacket, apple strudel on the lower face, plus little bobs of cream on the epaulets, was something we found difficult to salute. Someone covered in lemon curd was hit backwards through an open window. Our host, his head split open, suddenly appeared, rising cross-eyed and smiling above the mess. Molly, he shouted, and disappeared again. The news from Moscow was good. 
Major Chater Deck MC DSO had recovered enough to come on again and was rendered unconscious for the second time. He was immediately trodden underfoot. His baton grabbed his ankles and pulled him from the carnage, a seraphic smile on his face. There seemed no sign of the fight abating, so we played God Save the King and packed our gear. There was a lot of booze left in the kitchen. We drank it. Legend has it I slid to the floor, first calling for my mother or a priest. To make matters worse, the banned truck didn't arrive, so Edgington and Files dragged me along between them, with Kidgel walking behind making remarks. The billet was a mile and a half away. But after a while, the gunners Edgington and Files dropped Gunner Milligan in a ditch and said, sod it. They sat a while smoking, and Driver Kidgel said, I'll, I'll go and phone for a truck. An hour later, the battery water wagon arrived. It was two in the morning and I was starting to surface enough to notice that all the dragging had removed the soles from my boots. There was only enough room for three in the cabin, so Edgen and I sat astride the water tank on the back and drove through the black silent streets of Hailsham shouting, Night soil! Night soil! Thank God there wasn't any. Hailsham was this sort of place. The town mayor and the town idiot were the same man. If you look at a map, it's not marked. We made friends with a young jazz drummer named Dixie Dean. His father owned a radio shop in Hailsham High Street. It's still there. Sunday evenings, he'd invite the band to his room over the shop, and we'd sit listening to records. I bought my records from home. And the Sunday night record session was something we looked forward to with great pleasure. Dixie's mother would come in at intervals with tea and cakes. When the regiment went overseas, I left my records with Dixie. I'll collect them out of the war, was my parting line. I did, but alas... The house had been hit in a raid, and among the losses was my record collection, all save one which I still have, Jimmy Lunsford's Bugs Parade. I don't play it much. It creates such vivid memories. I have to go out for a walk. Even then, it's about three hours before I can settle down again. During our stay at Hailsham, a Captain John Council was posted to us. In those days, I knew nothing about the theatre at all, so it was not until after the war I realised his connection with the Theatre Royal Windsor. For the record, I quote from his book, Council's Opinion. Thus I found myself promoted to captain, it is true, but as second in command of D battery stationed at Bexhill and later at Hailsham. I was with it five months, during which time we had three different battery commanders, between the first and the second of which I had several weeks in temporary command. I greatly enjoyed this short burst of authority when I could run things more or less my own way. I tried out one idea which seemed to be valuable a public meeting of all ranks which followed the Saturday morning inspection. At it, anyone could make criticisms or suggestions to improve our standard of military proficiency or domestic arrangements. In deliberate contrast to the relaxed atmosphere of the public meetings, the inspection that preceded it was tough, rigorous and exacting. There was only one point in my tour where I used to detect a whiff of indiscipline. My exit from the OP was invariably followed by a roar of laughter. Someone had obviously cracked a quip at my expense. And I have no doubt as to who it was. To me, he was known as Signal Milligan, to his mate simply Spike. Years afterwards, when my daughters submitted their autograph books to the goons, one page was inscribed to my old captain's daughter, Spike Milligan. The only happening in Hailsham was the Saturday night dance in the Corn Exchange. Somehow we picked up a clarinet player, Sergeant Amstel. He was from the heavy coastal artillery, this was a huge 12-inch cannon mounted on a railway bogey with eight wheels and pulled by an engine. It was shunted back and forth along the south coast wherever the German invasion threatened. The gun crew lived in a converted railway carriage. The things they did. Late night, if they were short of fags, that actually drive the whole train, gun and all, to Hailsham Station, nip into the George, a quick bind, ten wood binds, and then back again. When Sergeant Amstel played with us at the Corn Exchange, he'd drive the train three miles to Hailsham, park it at the station siding for the evening, then drive it back after the dance. Absolutely ridiculous. Now, whereas wartime Hailsham offered boredom of an evening, nearby Eastbourne offered a greater variety of it. As a local said, there's nothing wrong with Hailsham, there's always the streets. On nights off, Harry and I would thumb a lift to Eastbourne. As empty vehicle after empty vehicle went by, we realised what a lot of bastards people were. A Canadian truck approached. When I saw it was not going to stop, I waved it farewell. Immediately, the truck stopped, backed up, and out jumped a furiously noisy-voiced Canadian officer. 
He was incensed that I dare wave the truck farewell. I'm not having any two-bit private being a smart aleck at my expense. Oh, there's no expense, sir. I said I did it free. It's forbidden for military vehicles to stop to give anyone a lift. Having had his moment of power, he drove away, taking his tiny mind with him. What can you say or do to a person like that? I mean, I was wishing he'd get killed the first day in action. My God, he started a chain reaction. From then on, I never gave any Canadian officer a lift, ever. Aren't I a swine? <laughs> Our first visit to Eastbourne led us to a pub from which issued forth music. The customers were all squaddies and their girls. The music was supplied by three elderly gentlemen on a small rostrum, piano, violin and cello. They made desperate attempts to be with it by playing in the mood, beat me daddy ate the bar, etc. But one felt that death was nigh. Suddenly, in the middle of a tune, the violinist downed his violin and started to collect the empty glasses which he took to the bar. What an original arrangement, said Harry. Sixteen bars solo, then eight bars collecting empties. This could open up the whole new field of entertainment, I agreed. What's wrong with sixteen bars solo, then eight bars painting the landing, and another eight bars chopping up wood? Great. Harry spotted it. The fiddle player only got down to collect the empties when the tune went into more than three flats. We spent the rest of the evening listening for the key changes. This is it. He'll start collecting now, said Harry gleefully, as the maestro did exactly that. Ever on the search for money, we asked the landlord if he'd like us to play some jazz one evening. He was a tall, very fat man. His face so red it appeared to have been sandpapered. He liked the idea. I'll speak to the missus, Flory. Flory? Flory arrived from the dark recesses of her saloon bar. Jazz, he said. Isn't that the noisy stuff? We assured her that it wasn't. It was finally agreed that we would be given a tryout on the coming Saturday. There was no money, but we could have drinks on the house, and we didn't have to collect the empties. It was nearly the last Saturday of my life. Eastbourne and excitement are foreign to each other. Peacetime Eastbourne, with its frail old ladies or russet-faced gentlemen dozing in wicker bath chairs very little from wartime. The town had been evacuated. The great wedding cake hotels were boarded up or occupied by the services. A few diehards remained. You'd see them mornings sitting in bus shelters reading the Times, or ladies in deck chairs knitting balaclavas. Which war are we knitting for, Penelope? They all objected to the triple skeins of barbed wire that ran the length of the seafront, disappearing towards Bexhill and Beachy Head. Who in their right mind would want to attack Eastbourne? We get the town a bad name. They were still trying to live down the fact that Van Gogh once stayed there. I mean, trying to chop off your ear, that just wasn't good enough. Saturday night saw D battery bands swinging away there. The pub was full. People passing heard the jazz and, of course, came in. The landlord was delighted. Never had such a crowd. People were standing jammed against the walls. The original trio were fully employed now, collecting the empties and looking much happier doing it, especially the violinist whose name I discover was Percy Ants. Percy Ants. We had to play it. We played I Can't Dance, I Got Ants in My Pants. Bang! 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 Three shots rang out. A woman screamed. Bang! The wall mirror behind me shattered. There was a struggle going on at the entrance door. More women screamed. It might have been men, but I didn't have time to check. Bang again! I hear a projectile whiz past me and thud into the wall behind me. It was a Scottish tank gunner who had been thrown out because of offensive behaviour. Outside, he drew his pistol and fired through the door. He had tried to get in, but a French-Canadian soldier grabbed his pistol arm and was now holding it pointed to the ceiling. This all happened in a flash. Recalling the heroism of the ship's orchestra on the Titanic, I went on playing. Turning round, I discovered that neither Edgington, Files, nor Kijil had heard of the Titanic affair and had gone. Kijil had dived through a door that just happened to be marked ladies. There were understandable screams from the occupants within. Edgington and Files had rushed to the bar and demanded free drinks. The offending soldier was finally disarmed. The military police arrived and took him away. Out of the ladies ran several females in various states of undress, followed sheepishly by gunner driver Kijil. Things settled down and we went on playing, but this time much quieter. If anything more was coming, we wanted to hear it. I visited the pub a few years ago. The place has been tarted up and watneyized. The old landlord was gone. No one remembered him, nor the gunfight. The rostrum and the old piano were still there. I went over and touched the keyboard. It's like patting an old horse you once knew. 
Larkhill. Things had been going too smoothly to continue as they were. It really was time we had another bout of applied chaos. It came in the shape of a sudden rush to the Larkhill artillery camp, Salisbury, hard by Stonehenge. It was January 1942, and quite the bitterest weather I could remember. We arrived after a dawn to sunset trip by road. Salisbury Plain was blue-white with hoar frost. I sat in the back of a Humber radio car, listening to any music I could pick up from the BBC and banging my feet to keep warm. We arrived tired, but being young and tired means you could go on all night. Having parked the vehicle, we were dismissed. The signalers were shown to a long wooden hut on brick piers. We dumped our kits on the beds with the usual fight for the lower bunk, then made for the O.R.'s mess and began queuing. Must have been the season for schemes, as the whole place was swarming with gunners. We were given pale sausages, not long for this world, and potatoes so watery we drank them. The camp had masses of hot showers, and we spent a pleasant hour under them, singing and enjoying the luxury of hot water. There was the usual comments about the size of one's wedding tackle. Core, what a beauty! Oh, he's bloody well hung! Or, Christ, his poor wife! etc. After a quick tea and a wad in the naffy, we went to the large cinema listen hut. It was the Glen Miller Orchestra in Sun Valley Serenade, and it was a feast of great big band sounds, plus at least ten good songs. Sitting in the naffy later, we tried to recall them. It was this way that we learnt most of the tunes for the band's repertoire. Seated at the piano, Harry tried to play some of the tunes from the film. Play the Warshaw Concerto, shouted a drunken Scot. At dawn the next day, the battery set off on a great ice-cold, frost-hardened Salisbury Plain. Most of us had put on two sets of woolen underwear, including the dreaded Long Johns. We were to practice a new speedy method of bringing a 25-pounder gun into action. Ahead of us would go a scouting OP. Somewhere on the plain, four 25-pounders drawn by quads would be moving in the direction of a common map reference, all linked to the OP by wireless. Ahead, the OP would establish itself at a point overlooking the enemy. Immediately, the OP would send out the signal Crash Action East, or whichever compass point applied. The information was received by gun wireless, whose operator would shout out to the gun officer the order received. The gun officer standing up in his truck would shout to the gun crew, Halt! Action East! The quad would break sharply. The gun crew, in a frenzy, unlimber the gun and face it east. While they were doing this, the OP would rapidly send down the rough range of the target. As soon as the gun crew had done this, they fired. In our case, from the first order to the firing of the first rounds was 25 seconds. This was the fastest time for the day. That night, in high spirits, we of the signal section decided to raid the specialists. After lights out, some 15 of us, faces blacked up, wearing balaclavas, carrying buckets of water and mud, mixed to a delightful consistency, crept towards the specialists' hut. I remember being first in. In the ensuing fight, I was mistaken for a specialist and got a bucket of it all to myself. For the next two hours, there was a game of hide-and-seek among the huts as the specialists under Bombardier Aubrey sought revenge. It was just too bad about Lieutenant Hughes, sitting quietly in the dark of the officer's toilet, got a bucket of mud full in the face. The next ten days saw us going through rigorous training. The weather was bitterly cold. I saw Sid Price smoke a cigarette down to the stub and burn the woolen mitten on his hand without feeling a thing. On the last day, B subsection were firing smoke shells. One got jammed in the breech. Sergeant Geordie Rowlands was in the process of removing the charge when it exploded in his hand. When the smoke cleared, Rowlands was looking at the stump of his wrist with his right hand ten yards away on the ground. There was a stunned silence, and then he said, Well, I'll be fucked. Apart from initial shock, he was OK. But for him, the war finished on Salisbury Plain. The severed hand was buried where it fell by Busty Roberts. As he dug a small hole, Driver Watt said, You're going to shake hands before you bury it? Butty Roberts' reply was never recorded. That night, there was an officer's and all ranks dance in the drill hall. We all worked hard to extricate all the best-looking ATS girls from the magnetic pool of the officers and sergeants. Alas, we failed. So we reverted to the time-honoured sanctuary of the working man, drink. We finally reached the stage of inebriation when we were willing to do the last dance with any good-looking Lance Bombardier. Next day, Saturday, the last day at camp, we were allowed into Salisbury. I went to see the cathedral. I shall never forget the feeling of awe when I walked in. A boy's choir was singing something that sounded like Monteverdi.
The voices soared up the fluted columns as though on wings. The morning autumn sun was driving through the stained glass windows, throwing colours onto the floor of the nave. The whole building was a psalm in stone. It all made me aware of the indescribable joy derived from beauty. Court's bloody big, isn't it? said Spider Smith. He was right. It was bloody big. There was a beer up that night, and another dance. After twenty-three, forty-three hours, I don't remember anything. Next day we returned to the jewel of the south coast, beautiful Bex Hill. Learning to drive. The time had come, the army said, to speak of many things, like teaching us to drive military vehicles. The reason was, we had new vehicles arriving at such a rate they were outnumbering the drivers. So, several of the signalers were selected for tuition, among them yours truly. It was done under the supervision of Bombardier Ginger Edwards. It was not unpleasant. Every morning the trainees would be bundled onto the back of a 1500-weight Bedford truck and driven to a deserted country road, and instructions started from there. Allowing for the possible stupidity of the pupils, the instructions were shot through with insults. The spelling was based on Bombardier Edwards' annunciation. This end is the front end, and the back end is the us end. This round object mounted on a spindle with three spokes is the steering wheel. Any questions? No? Good. Now this vehicle is like a human being. It has to be feeded the right ingredients for it to go. Understand? The ingredients are one, petrol, oil and water. Each one has its own hole for pouring in. If you put it in the wrong hole, it will cease to function. And so on. After this highly technical briefing, we were given a go at starting the engine and proceeding in first gear. Most of us got the hang of it very soon, all save Gunner Edgington. He managed to perform a mechanical miracle with a truck that we thought was just impossible, i.e. Edgington at the wheel, truck ascending a steep gradient. Bobbany Edwards says now, go down to first. Edgington disengages from fourth and somehow goes into reverse, but so smoothly it was not until we had travelled backwards ten yards that the mistake was discovered. I myself had a moment of fear. I was driving, and we were approaching a T-junction. Turn left here, said Edwards. I did, but it was a trick. The road ended almost immediately in a rough field and was intended to test my braking ability. I jammed my foot onto the brake, missed it, and went onto the accelerator. The truck shot forward down a two-foot ditch. As we hit the field, I pulled the wheel to the left to get us back onto the road, but for love no money I could not get my foot off the accelerator. I just prayed. All the time there were yells and threats from the bouncing occupants in the back of the truck. Finally, after fifteen nightmare seconds, we hit the road again, where I managed to put my foot on the brake. There was dead silence. Then Edwards and I looked at each other and burst out laughing. Another memorable moment was again Harry Edgington. Driving along the front at Hastings, Bombardier Edwards decided to test Edgington's reflexes. Quick, stop. There's a child on the road, he shouts. No, there isn't, said Gunner Edgington, looking. <laughs> From motor vehicles, we went on to Bren carriers. They were marvellous. They could go anywhere, and didn't we do just that? Having passed all the tests, we were promoted to driver operators, which meant, as from the 24th of the 10th, 42, I was a Class 3 tradesman driver operator, so I got a few shillings more per day. Jankers. Jankers can be painful. It usually means confined to barracks and menial tasks like, Soldier, pick up that menial cigarette. My first jankers was for causing a fire. In the hard winter of 1940, coal fires were forbidden, except on Sundays. But I was freezing on a Saturday. My bed was on the first floor, directly in line with the North Pole. The window was over the coal shed. With a rope and a length of bucket, it was simple. Edgington went down, filled up the bucket, and I'd haul it up. Suddenly, with a full bucket half ascended, a snap inspection. All the officer, I front. I turned, managed to face him, arms behind me. I nearly got away with it, but Edgington gave a tug on the rope to haul up, and I was pulled backwards out of the window. The game was up. I blamed Edgington. Edgington blamed me. We blamed the Germans, Flurry Ford, and finally, that bloody awful Warsaw Concerto. Captain Martin gave us a roasting. It's a degrading trick, depriving other men of their fuel ration. Indeed, it's a disgrace, he said, standing with his back to a roaring coal fire on a Monday. Most jankers' time was spent lagging the plumbing. This was called up your pipe. Another fatigue was peeling spuds. We delighted in peeling spuds to the size of peas. It made no difference. They cooked the peel as well. 
It's not too difficult to become a military criminal. Not shaving, dirty boots, calling a sergeant darling, or selling your brain carrier. Any Sunday down Petticoat Lane, you could find some of the lads selling lorries, jerry cans, bullets, webbing. Get your lovely empty aircraft guns here! It got so that military depots were shopping there for supplies. Often, London-based regiments sent their quarter blocks out for a gross of three-inch mortars and a dozen bananas. It was common knowledge that Caledonian Road Market was a German supply depot. The true story behind Hess. He flew here for cut-price black market underwear for the SS, but on arrival he chickened out when Churchill told him the price. Unconditional surrender. An easy way to go on the hooks was not saluting at commissioned rank. You are not saluting... An officer, you are saluting the king's uniform. Gunnar Stover took this as gospel. At the valley, he would wake Lieutenant Button with a cup of tea, turn, face Button's uniform hanging on the wall, salute it and exit. Oh, there's no need to take it that far, Stover, said Button. I can't help it, sir. I come from a military family. If I didn't salute that uniform, I feel I was living a lie, sir. But, reasoned Button, when no one's looking, there's no point. Begging your pardon, sir, but there is. Many a time, when I'm alone, cleaning up your billets, when I finish, I face your best betteress and I salute it. No one sees me, but deep down, I know I'm on my own alone with tradition. How long have you been in the army, Stover? Thirty two years, sir. Very good, said Button, very good. We had saluting traps. A crowd of us round a corner, smoking, would get the tip officer coming. We would set off at ten-second intervals and watch as the officer saluted his arm to paralysis. Dieppe. On August the 18th, 1942, we were learning how to shoot Bren and Vickers machine guns at Fairbright. The range was on the cliff facing out to sea. Our instructors were from the Brigade of Guards. We stood at ease while a Grenadier Guard sergeant told us the intricacies of the Vickers 303 water-cooled machine gun. I'll first teach you which is a safe end and which is a naughty end. Next, I will show you how to load, point, and fire the weapon. Following this, I will dismantle the gun and reassemble it. It's not difficult. I have a three-year-old daughter at home who does it in six minutes. Anyone here fired one before? I had, but I wasn't going to fall into that trap. Never volunteer for anything in the army. So the day started. It was worth it just to hear the military repartee. What's the matter with you, man? Pointing that bloody gun at the target. I've seen a blind cripple hunchback shoot straighter than that. Don't close your eyes when you pull the trigger. Remember, Mummy wants you to grow up a brave little soldier, didn't she? You're firing into the ground, man. I suppose you shoot Germans, not bloody worms. Steady, steady. You're stretching the trigger. Squeeze it slowly, like a bird's tits. Left-handed, are you? Well, I'm sorry we can't have a, a weapon built for you. You'll have to learn to be right-handed for the duration. Then to little Flash Gordon, who got in a hopeless mess trying to load the Bren. No, no, son. Tell you what. You go and stand behind the trees and say the Lord's Prayer and ask me to tell you to stop wasting my bloody time. The day was alive with these sayings. It all ended badly for me. As we climbed onto the three-tonner to go back to Billet, Driver Jenkins slammed the tailboard on my right hand. It came up like a balloon. I don't mind saying I was cross-eyed with agony. They took me to Hastings to St. Helen's Hospital to have it x-rayed. I had no broken bones. They bandaged the hand up and put my arm in a sling. What a bloody hang-up. I was going on leave the next day. By now, my father had rejoined the army as captain in the RAOC. The family were living at Linden House, Orchard Way, Reigate. I arrived home after dark, having had difficulty getting a lift from the station. My mother and father were not given to drinking in pubs, so after dinner I went to the bell by myself. The bell stood at the crossroads near our house. Of course, this was the day of the raid on Dieppe and its heroic failure. It was in the papers and on the radio. Some of the battery trucks had been commandeered to pick up some of the survivors at Peacehaven. Lance Bombardier Lees drove one truck and told me of seeing the survivors come home. They were all silent, their faces painted black. They came ashore with hardly a word. Some of the badly wounded had died on the way back. What can anyone say? Anyhow, that evening when I walked into the pub with my hand all in new white bandages, I was on to free drinks for the night. An elderly, dignified man came across and said to me, Would you care to have a drink with me and my friends? I said yes, and seeing it was free, I had a scotch. 
After a few words of conversation, the elderly man said, "'What was it like, son?' "'What was what like?' I said. "'Oh, come on, son. No need to be modest.' "'Oh, see, I don't know what you mean.' The elderly man winked at his friends and nodded approvingly towards me. Then it hit me. Dieppe. Had I been to Dieppe? If I said no, the chance of a lifetime to drink free all night would be thrown away. Yes. I had been to Dieppe. A double whiskey, please. Yes. We went in and, uh, cheers. I was in the last wave. Oh, oh, oh yes, another whiskey, please. Anyhow, I crawled towards this pillar box... Well, uh, all right, a brandy, then, and... That night my mother put me to bed. For two hours I'd been a hero, something I'd never been before and would never be again. Detention. October 1942. We were alerted for a practice shoot at Sennybridge Camp in Wales. Burdened down with kit, I decided to hide my rifle in the rafters of the hayloft. That's a good idea, said patriotic Edgington. The short of it was, several other patriots did the same. And it came to pass, that after we had gone thence, there cometh the quarter bloke, and in the goodness of his heart, he did inspect ye Haloff, and woe he findeth rifles, and was sore distressed. Whereupon he reported us to the Major, who on September the 14th, 1942, give us at all fourteen bloody days detention. For some reason, all the other criminals were sent to the RHQ at Cookfield, but I was sent to Preston Barracks, Brighton. Alone, no escort. Ah, oh, they trusted me. At Brighton Station, I tried to thumb a lift. I got one from an ATS girl driving a general staff car. She dropped me right outside Preston Barracks. As the car stopped, the sentry came to attention. Then I got out. I reported to the sergeant IC guardroom. Welcome to Preston Barracks, Brighton, he said. You're welcome to it too, I replied. No, he said. From now on, you keep your mouth shut and your bowels open. Then he gave me a cup of tea that did both. He stripped me of all my kit, leaving essentials like my body. The cell. My God, it must have been built in anticipation of Houdini. Seven foot by six foot by twenty foot high. Stone floor, small window with iron bar up near the ceiling. Wooden bed in corner. The door was solid iron, two inches thick, with a small spy hole for the guard. No light. You go to sleep when it gets dark, like all good little birdies do, said the sergeant. Make yourself comfortable, he said, slamming the cell door. Every day a visit from the orderly officer, a white consumptive lad who appeared to be training for death. Got everything you want? Uh, no, sir. I haven't got a Bentley. I grinned to let him know it was a joke and that I was a cheery soul and not downhearted. It wasn't the way he saw it. He pointed to a photo of my girl by my bed. That'll have to go. Yes, sir. Where would you like it to go? I think it would look nice on the piano. Put it out of sight. But it's my fancy, sir. Photographs are not allowed. He was starting to dribble. What about statues, sir? He lost his English school. Sergeant, put this man under arrest. He's uh, already under arrest, sir. Well, um, give him extra fatigues for being impertinent. I planned revenge. I cut my fingernails. On the next visit, I placed them in a cigarette lid. What are theirs? Uh, fingernails, sir. Throw them away. Uh, they are my fiancée, sir. Throw them away. Very good, sir. Next time he visited... I'd cut a small lock of my hair, tied a small bow in it, and placed it on my bed. What's that? The lock of hair, sir. Throw it away. It's my fiancée, sir, etc., etc. The last one I planned was with an artificial limb, but the officer never visited me again. He was drafted overseas and killed during an air raid on Tobruk. A naffy tear fell on his head. My duties were not unpleasant. One, Ravalli 0600, make tea for the guard. Drink lots of tea. Two, collect blackberries along the railway bank for sergeant's mess tea. Three, in pouring rain, shovel two six-foot-high piles of coke into one uniform conical heap. A bad day. Four, commission to draw a naked Varga girl for guard room. A good day. Five, trip to beach to collect winkles for sergeant's mess tea. Six, weed prayed ground by hand. Bloody awful day. Seven, commission to draw Varga girl for sergeant's mess. Another good day. Eight, oil all locks and hinges at Preston Barracks, sandpaper door of cell, prime undercoat and paint gunmetal black. Nine, drive Major Druce Bangley to Eastbourne. His driver had been taken ill with an overdose of whiskey. For him to have it off with his wife in house on seafront. 
After fourteen days I was sent back to Hailsham. I arrived to find the whole battery boarding lorries. Yes, yes, prepare to move yet again. With my kit I jumped into a fifteen hundred weight, making it a sixteen hundred weight. Where are we going? I don't know. It's another secret destination, said Sergeant Dawson. Three hours later we were back to our secret destination, Square One, Bexhill. Who is to make up their fucking minds, said Sergeant Dawson. Look, Sarge, they're moving us about to make us look a lot, said Gunner Tom. Yeah, we look a lot, said Dawson, a lot of cunts. Give us a merry song, Sarge, I said, running for cover. <laughs> After the war, in 1968, I was appearing at the Royal Theatre Brighton. I took a trip to Preston Barracks, all changed. The old guard room with my cell had gone. Everything had changed, except for the large parade ground. It was still there. Did I really weed it by hand in 1942? We must have been all bloody mad. December 1942, January 1943. Embarkation leave. As the monkey keeper at the zoo said, when a newly trussed up gorilla arrived, it was bound to come. We were going overseas. Of course, we should have gone yesterday. Everything had to be packed into everything else yesterday. Some uh, great wooden crates appeared yesterday. Good God, said Edgington yesterday. They're sending us all by parcel post. The crates were filled, nailed down and stenciled this way up, at all angles. Vehicles had to be waterproofed. Oh, dearie me. This smacked of a beach landing. Everything was camouflaged black and dark green, so it couldn't be the desert. All our missing clothing was replaced. We then ran straight down to the town and sold them. One issue was a large vacuum-sealed tin of emergency chocolate, only to be eaten in the event of, say, being surrounded by the enemy. That night, in bed, surrounded by the enemy, I ate my emergency chocolate. The news had been broken by the old man in the Naffy Hut, the dear old Naffy Hut. In it we wrote letters home, drank tea, played ping-pong, banged tunes out on the piano, or, when we had no money, just sat there to keep warm. It was in this hut that I first heard the voice of Churchill on the old brown Bakelite echo radio. On the day of the official pronouncement, we were marched in and sat down. Enter Major Chaterjack. Ice front! Chaterjack acknowledges battery. Sergeant Major salutes. At ease, Sergeant Major. At ease it is. You can all smoke, said Chaterjack. I'm going to. Light laughter. Smilingly, he started to speak. You may have been hearing rumours that we were going abroad. Laughter. Rumours had been non-stop. We are finally going overseas. It's what we've all been trained for, so it shouldn't come as a shock. He cut out all the unnecessary gas, told us dates and times. A very Scots voice in the back said, Where are we going, sir? Well, I know it's not Glasgow. Roars of laughter. Embarkation leave will start immediately. Married men first. They need it. Laughter. A voice from the back, Don't we all? Loud laughter. He told us that there would be a farewell dinner dance at the Devonshire Arms. He finished with good luck to you all. It was a time of incredible excitement. God knows how we got so much done in so short a time. Men usually only have one active participation in a war during their lifetime. It was about to happen to us. We had problems. For instance, the double base we had knocked off from the Delaware Pavilion. I haven't mentioned this before because I've been waiting for the original owner to die. It was stolen in anticipation of Alf Files learning to play it. It had been noticed that the base had been lying in the corner of a backstage room. We measured the size, passed the measurements on to Bombardier Donaldson, who had a crate made to fit. The outside of the crate was stencil Mark III Beaufort gun spares. One morning after parade, we drove to the pavilion and hurried in through the back door with the crate. A few moments later, we hurried out with it. Nothing had changed, save the weight had increased by one double base. It was rushed out to our workshops, where high-speed work was done in stripping the varnish off, staining the wood a deep black oak, then re-varnishing. It was whilst in the middle of the last mentioned operation that we got our overseas sailing orders, so, not wanting to lose the fruits of our labours, we decided to give the base to Harry Eddington to take home for his brother Doug, who was desperate to learn to play the instrument. Somewhere in the dark of a December evening, Harry smuggled the base aboard a London-bound train and put it down at his home in St John's Road, Archway. While we were overseas, we had a letter saying that Doug had won first prize for the best bass player in London and had won a Melody Maker medal. 
Who said crime doesn't pay? Our leaves overlapped. I went straight home to Rissaline Road, Broccoli Rise, where my family had returned when my father was posted back to London. I arrived at Victoria Station during the rush hour. The crowd were a weird mixture of grey faces carrying early Christmas shopping. I was wearing my new red artillery forage cap and felt rather conspicuous. I took the crowded tube to London Bridge and then from there a train to Honor Oak Park. The faces of the commuters were tired and pinched. Occasionally one would steal a look at me. I don't know why. To break the boredom, I suppose. A man of about fifty, in a dark suit and overcoat, leaned over and said, Would you like a cigarette? Thank you, I said, and like a bloody fool smoked it. A bloody fool, because, dear reader, I had just gone through three weeks' agony having given up the habit. As I walked from the station down Rizzoli Road, a raid was in progress. It was very, very dark, and I had to peer closely at several doors before I arrived at number 50. The family were about to have dinner in the Anderson shelter. Ah, son, said my father, that wonderful welcoming voice he had. You're just in time for the main course. Holding a torch, he showed me down the garden. Put that bloody light out, said my brother in a mock ARP warden voice. The voice was in the process of breaking, and I swear in speaking that short sentence he went from middle C to A above the stave. By the light of a hurricane lamp called Storm Saviour Brand, I squeezed next to my mother. They had made the shelter as comfortable as possible, with duck boards and a carpet on top, an oil heater, books, and a battery radio. Mother said grace. Then the four of us started eating lukewarm powdered egg, dehydrated potatoes, leaf-len carrots, and wartime strength tea. I felt awful. So far I hadn't suffered anything. Seeing the family in these miserable circumstances did raise a lump in my throat. But they, they seemed cheery enough. Got a surprise for you, son, said father, putting his hand under the table, and produced a bottle of Chateau Latour 1934. It's shelter temperature, he said. We drank a toast to the future. The next time the family would drink a toast together would be ten years later. Mother related how the week previously the whole family had nearly been killed. It was nine at night. Father, wearing aught but Marks and Spencer's utility long underwear and tartan slippers, was heavily poised in the kitchen making a cup of tea, strength three. He was awaiting that jet of steam from the kettle that signals the invention of the steam engine. In the lounge, oblivious of the drama in the kitchen, were my mother and brother. This bedroom had been modified into a bedroom come sitting room, double bed in one corner, and a single for my brother in the other. This arrangement made my brother's night manipulations extremely difficult. However, mother was seated on an elephantine imitation brown moquette couch with eased springs, knitting balaclavas for the lads at the front. My brother Desmond, a lad of fourteen, was sitting on his bed looking through his wartime scrapbook, reading out aloud sections on Hitler's promised invasion. A two-thirds slag, one-third coal fire, smoked merrily in the grate. Suddenly, a colossal explosion, a range Luftwaffe. Mother was blown six feet up in the sitting position, then backwards over the couch. My brother was shot up against the wall, reaching ceiling level before returning. The fire was sucked up the chimney, as were my mother's CNA mode slippers. The cheeseman of Lewisham's imitation velour curtains billowed in, and the room was filled with ash. It was all over in a flash. My mother was upside down behind the couch. My father appeared at the door. What's happening, he said. He presented a strange figure, clutching a steaming kettle, and smoke blackened from head to foot with soot. He said, wait here. He went to the back door and shouted, Anybody there? He then returned and said, It's all right, he's gone. Despite the activities of German bombers, I was determined to sleep in my old bed. Sheets, sheer bliss. Lying in bed, I realized that the family was finally broken up. The war had made inroads on our peacetime relationship. I was independent. My brother no longer had my company. All was changed. For the better, we'll never know. We had been a, a very close-knit family, something not many British families were. The New Cross Pallida dance was still open. Next night I took Lily Chandler, a girl in whom I had a 51% controlling interest, to the Palais. It was a long room with a gallery running round the top. Chicken wire had been stretched below the gallery because of the habit of people throwing things down on the dancers. A five-piece band were blowing its way through the wartime standard tunes. The room was packed with civvies, soldiers, sailors and airmen. With the windows closed and blackouts, the atmosphere was stifling. I spent the evening waltzing, foxtrotting and chatting up Miss Chandler. I still see the bobbing heads of the dancers and the reflected spots from the revolving glass ball above me. 
Every dance in those days ended with the waltz, Who's Taking You Home Tonight? And everyone would sing it sotto voce as they glided around. While I was doing this, the last bloody tram was leaving. So I had to walk, Miss Chandler, back to 45 Reverend Road, Brockley, a matter of two miles. The raid was still on. We walked back through deserted streets. Occasional fragments of ack-ack shells would whoosh down and spat on the pavement. They do say, if you were hit by one of our own ack-ack fragments, you could have your rates reduced. Lily was wearing black. I think she had a premonition about me. As we approached Malpass Road, a stick of three bombs fell about half a mile to our left, but they passed directly overhead and Lily and I lay down against the wall. While we were down there, I tried to make love to her. Don't be a fool, she said. That was close, she remarked. I'm not sure whether she referred to the bombs or me. I spent some half an hour kissing her good night in the doorway and tried everything, but she kept saying, Stop it! Or don't come the old assing with me. So I walked another two miles back to my house, bent double with pain and sexual frustration. My week's leave was spent in sitting in with local gig bands, seeing people from Woolwich Arsenal, where I'd worked before the war, drinking and walking home bent double with sexual frustration from 45 Revlon Road, Brockley. I arrived back off leave and I quote from my diary, returned back at billets to find everybody drunk, jolly or partially out of their minds. The knowledge that at last we were going overseas had given the battery the libertine air of the last days at school. It was impossible to try and sleep. Everyone was hell-bent on playing practical jokes. Beds crashed down in the night, buckets of water were fixed over doors, boots were nailed to the floor, there were yells and screams as thunder flashes exploded under the unsuspecting victim's bed. The battery was in a state of flux. Most were on leave, others were about to go, others were on their way back, some couldn't get back, others didn't want to. One night the barracks were full, the next night they were empty. God knows who was running us, certainly all the officers were on leave. What one good fifth columnist could have wrought at that time doesn't bear thinking about. I remember very well one rainy night, Harry and I lay in bed, talking, smoking, unable to sleep with excitement. Let's go and have a jam in the naffy, he said. It seemed a good idea. It was about one in the morning when we got in. For an hour we played These Foolish Things, Room 504, Serenade in Blue, Falling Leaves, and the Inevitable Blues. In retrospect, it wasn't a happy occasion. Two young men, away from home, playing sentimental tunes in a pitch-black dark naffy. Oh, yesterday, leave me alone. Friday, December the 18th, 1942. The place? The Devonshire Arms. The occasion? The farewell dinner and dance for D Battery. It was Chater Jack's idea, and I think I'm right in saying that he paid for the whole evening himself, because I overheard Captain Martin saying to him, You'll pay for this. For the first time, D Battery Band didn't play. The music was provided by Jack Shaw and his band. We would have liked to have played, but Chater Jack insisted that we had the night off for once. It was a marvellous evening. We all enjoyed the dinner despite the frugal wartime fare. The enthusiasm of the occasion was terrific. In retrospect, I don't suppose many of the lads had ever been to a dinner dance on this scale. It was the eve of what for most of us was the greatest adventure of our lives. The moment for speeches arrived, and BSM Poole rapped on the table with a knife handle. Order, please, for the battery commander, Major Chatterjack, MC, DSO. We gave the old man a wild round of clapping, infiltrated with cockney witticism. Good old chair. Hold on, I haven't finished me duff yet. The Major was in great form. He had already been in one war, so he knew what it was all about. Taking a swig at his favourite whisky, he wiped his mouth with a napkin and said, Fellow gunners, this got a spontaneous cheer, we are going to war. It's not much to worry about. At this spot he got groans. At least not this evening. He went on through a fairly predictable speech, war being long periods of boredom, broken by moments of great excitement. During moments of boredom, I will order a certain amount of blankowing. Here he got great groans and cries of not again. With a gleam in his eye, he went on. Ah, but during moments of intense excitement, I will order a double issue of rum ration. Now a toast. The king. We all stood and drank and mumbled the king. Next, we had the guest speaker. Silence, please, for Captain Arrowsmith, RHQ. Captain Arrowsmith rose. He was a tough man. In many ways, he reminded me of Colonel Custer, in that he was a glory seeker. He was a brave man and was killed in action in Italy. Gentlemen, he commenced, the Royal Regiment have an appointment for the Bosch, and as you know... The Royal Regiment always keeps its appointments. 
This sort of rhetoric got the gunners all patriotic, and he got a storm of applause. He made us all feel important. He ended his speech with the toast, Gentlemen, the regiment. The regiment, we echoed. What bloody regiment, said a drunken voice. The dinner over, the dance got underway. Some lads had brought their wives down for the occasion. The local mistresses and girlfriends were all present. Everyone knew everyone. I picked up a waff corporal. Her name was Betty. I forget the surname. I ended up in bed with her, somewhere in Cooden Drive. I always remember a woman looking round the door and saying, Have you got enough blankets? And I replied something like, How dare you enter the king's bedchamber when he's discussing foreign policy? This sudden late affair with Betty flowered rapidly, and we did a lot of it in the last dying days prior to embarkation. Actually, I was glad when we left. I couldn't have kept up this non-stop soldiering all day and lover all night with only cups of tea in between. I was having giddy spells, even laying down. I don't suppose there's anything more exciting than a sudden affair. It is the sort of thing that defeats the weather and gives you a chance to air your battle dress. When I went overseas, Betty wrote me sizzling letters that I auctioned to the battery lechers. The train journey, Bexel to Liverpool. The date was the 6th of January, 1943. The time, just before midnight. An army on the march. Weather, pissing down. Standing in a black street, the hammer of the Germans stands silent in full FSMO. With arms aching from typhus, typhoid and tetanus injections, Edgington and I had been detailed to carry a porridge container. Quick march! Shuffle, shamble, slip, shuffle, scrape. Nearing the station, a voice in the dark. Anybody remember to turn the gas off? Stop that talking! Bollocks! No swearing now, vicar! The rain. It seemed to penetrate everything. We reached the station soaked. My porridge carrying arm was six inches longer. Down the stairs we trooped onto the platform where the train was now not waiting in the station. Permission to smoke? An hour went by. We struck up a quiet chorus of Why are we waiting? Followed by outbreaks of bleating. <coughs> Stop that! At 2.14 a.m. the train arrived. Ironic cheers. All aboard! And the fight for seats got underway. A compartment packed with twelve fully equipped gunners looks like those mountainous piles of women's clothing at a jumble sale. Once sat down, you were stuck. If you wanted to put your hand in a pocket, three men in the carriage had to get up. The train started. As it pulled fretfully from the station, I suddenly realised that some of us were being driven to our deaths. Edgington and I in the corridor decided to look for somewhere special to settle. The guard's van? It was empty, save for officers' bedrolls. Just the job. Removing our webbing, we lay like young khaki gods rampant on a field of kit bags. The young gods then lit up a couple of woodbines. We passed the time with our song puns game. Me. What is the song of the obstetrician? Edgington, I don't know. I'm always on the outside looking in. Edgington, swine. What is the song of the barren female fish? Me. What? Edgington, no rose in all the world. Me. Rotten. What is the song of the man who lost his old cigarette lighter and found it again? What? My old flame. Scum, says Edgington. What did Eve sing when she covered her fanny with a fig leaf? I cover the waterfront. Correct. One point to you. It's rude to point. Right, said Edgington. One blunt to you, then. Just a minute. I've suddenly been overrun by a herd of drunken Peruvian trombonists on Pleasure Bent. Me. Pleasure Bent? I like mine straight. Ta-da! It was going on for three o'clock. We fell asleep to the iron calypso of the wheels and the raindrop typewriter on the windows. I was awakened at about seven by Harry handing me a mug of tea. I looked out the window. We were passing at considerable speed through black countryside sprinkled with snow. We must be going north, I thought. I ladle out some porridge into our mess tins. It was cold. Only one way to warm it up. Eat it. Bombardier True of the signal section sauntered in. He had a large set of protruding teeth, but for this feature he would have been ugly. Seeing the luxury we were living in, he said, You cunning bastards. You know where I slept last night? Sitting up in the bleeding cursey. We tried to soothe them with gifts of cold porridge. True said he thought we were going to Scotland. Why Scotland? Well, I tell you. We're going to make landings in Norway. It's a second front, mate. We link up with the Russians. Oh, Christ, Grunnigdon. Norway, that's done it. Why? I told my family it was Malta. What about my family? I told them Bournemouth. Conversation was cut short by the panicky entrance of Gunner Sims. Quick, where's the medical officer? 
Is it the old trouble, darling? I said, taking his hand. Don't piss around. There's been a bloody accident. Two sergeants came running through on the same errand. They returned with the medical officer. Excitement. A gunner in the forward carriage and intentionally shot himself in the leg with a Tommy gun. The weapon was on automatic and had torn a great hole in the man next to him as well. There was blood everywhere. The medical officer did all he could to make them comfortable. There was no morphia. It must have been agony. They both survived, though the innocent party remained lame for life. January the 7th, 2.45 that afternoon, we arrived at Liverpool Station. An ambulance was waiting for the two wounded men. We detrained. Chaos. Non-commissioned officers kept running into each other, shouting orders. Captains bounded up and down the platform like spring heel Jack, shouting, I see! Sergeant! Dawson clobbered Chalky White and myself. You two, see the officers' baggage into the tree tunnel. Great. We didn't have to march. Gradually, the battery drained out of the station. We had to wait hours for the lorry. We loaded the officer's kit on and drove through the black, gloomy streets with its grey wartime people. But it was still all adventure to us. It was dark when we arrived at the docks, which bore scars of heavy bombing. Toward the New Brighton side of the Mersey, searchlights were dividing the sky. Our ship was HMTL-15, in better days the SS Otranto a passenger ship. She had been converted to an armed troop ship with AA platforms fore and aft. Her gross was about 20,000 tonnes. Oh, I could be a couple of pounds out. Just to cheer us up, she was painted black. Loading took all night. There were several other units embarking. We got the officers' bedrolls into the cargo nets and then boarded. A ship's boatswain. What regiment? He said. Artillery? Three decks down. H deck. You're on H deck. H deck was just above the waterline. The portholes were sealed and blacked out. Such a pity, I wanted to see the fishers. Along each side were tables and forms to accommodate the twelve men at a time. Fore and aft were ship's lockers with hammocks, strange things that some said we had to sleep in. Ridiculous! Long about ten o'clock, the lads were wandering freely exploring the ship. Some had dodged ashore and were standing at the dock gate chatting up late birds. It was their last chance. Other men, more honourable, were furiously writing the last V-mail before sailing. I went under the top deck, aft, smoked a cigarette, and watched the oily reflections in the dark waters below. So far, it had all been fun, but now we were off to the truth. I don't know why, but I started to cry. 11.30. There was to be a demonstration of how to live in a hammock. I arrived in time to see an able-bodied seaman deftly put one up between two hooks, then vault into it without falling out. It looked easy. Nobody wanted to sleep. I worked out we were waiting for the tide. At about one o'clock the ship took on an air of departure. Gangways were removed, hatches covered, chains rattled. The ship started to vibrate as the engines came to life. Waters swirled, tugs moved in, donkey engines rattled, horses were dropped from the bollards and trailed like dead eels in the oil-tinted Mersey. We were away. Slowly we glided downstream. To the east we could hear the distant cough of Akak guns. The time was one ten. January the 8th, 1943. We were a mile downstream when the first bomb started to fall on the city. Ironically, a rosy glow tinged the sky. Liverpool was on fire. The lads came up on deck to see it. Away we went further and further into the night. Finally, drizzle and darkness sent us below. I set about putting up my hammock. It was very easy and I vaulted into it like an old salt. No, I didn't fall out. Sorry. In the dark, I smoked a cigarette and thought, we were going to war. Would I survive? Would I be frightened? Could I survive a direct hit at point-blank range by a German 88 millimeter? Could I really push a bayonet into a man's body, twist it and pull it out? I mean, what would the neighbors say? January 1943 at sea. By dawn, the regiment were at sea, but then we always had been. Ravalli was at 0700. Sailors wore bells to tell the time. They would shake their wrists and shout, Six bells! Swallow cups of hot tar, sing several yo-ho-hos, tie knots in each other's appendages, and hornpipe the dawn away. Breakfast was at eight o'clock bells. Two men from each table were detailed to collect it from the galley. Joke of the day. Captain, I've brought up your breakfast. Serves you right for eating it. After a breakfast of kippers, anchors, and scurvy, we had roll call. There had been soul-searching at high level, as we were unexpectedly excused boots and allowed plimsolls. At night, 
were excused for themselves and allowed feet. The confined airtight sleeping of 10,000 hairy gunners below decks had filled the air with a reek of stale cigarettes, sweat and a taste in your mouth like the inside of a long-distant runner's sock. We groped our way through the fog up to the main deck. The day was dove grey, low cloud, a slight green-grey swell. We gulped in the clean air. During the night, several ships had joined the convoy. Two low-slung destroyers were the outriders. Alongside floated serene, silent white seagulls, whose dignity dissolved into shrieking scavengerism at the sight of ships offal. There was a canteen on the main deck, open from ten till twelve, then three till six, then eight till ten, for the sale of tea and biscuits that tasted like offcuts of hardboard. Harry and I promenaded the decks. From what we could glean, the Otranto was a fine ship. Perhaps it was, but why did the captain sleep in a lifeboat? Harry and I promenaded the decks. At nine o'clock and a half bells, we heard the BBC news over the ship's speaker. The Russians were advancing on all fronts. Where did they get the money? Gunnar Sims, an amateur astronomer with a compass from a Christmas cracker, had worked out we were going south. So Harry and I promenaded the decks, knowing full well we were going south. The rest of the day was spent doing nothing except going south. In our wake, the sea was a mixture of bubbling turquoise and white. Seagulls stayed with us two days and nights, then suddenly left. Every third day we were to wear boots to stop our feet getting soft. Whereas the days were getting warmer, the weather was deteriorating. That's the worst of travelling on the cheap. The Otranto, with the capacity loading, was low in the water. She started to do a figure-of-eight roll. The first seasickness started. In three days since leaving, the convoy got bigger by six ships and two destroyers. They always seemed to join us just after dark. Still no news where we were going. Gunner Sims thought we were on the fringe of Biscay, and I'd suffered the Bay of Biscay many times. I knew how bad it could get, and get it did. On the night of January the 13th, already in heavy seas, we hit a Force 9 gale. Christ! Seas became mountainous. We listed alarmingly. Furniture broke loose. Crockery shattered on the decks. A sliding table broke sight in Hendrix's legs, so he was out of it. Though, of course... He could fight lying down. Ha-ha! Seeing a man upright was a thing of the past. I went round saying, What's your angle, man? At night, the hammocks swung like violent pendulums. The top of gunner Jack Shapiro's came undone. His lovely head hit the floor. He lay there. Was he asleep or unconscious and asleep? To bring him round, we would have to wait till he woke up and became conscious. With true military gallantry, we left him there. On captain's orders, we all slept in life jackets. Bloody uncomfortable. Realize what a woman with a 42-inch bosom felt like sleeping face down with on her back. Pardon? That night, the storm raging, I fell into a none too peaceful sleep. Next day, oh dear, men were sick everywhere. Some managed to get to the toilets, but as the days passed and they weakened, they were sick where they stood. I was all right, but I kept having to leap clear. It was my turn to collect breakfast. With two heavy containers, I swayed like Blondin over the Niagara. To complicate matters, it was another boot day. Decks were soaking wet. Containers full. I left the galley. The ship tilted. I started sliding at increasing speed towards the red-hot stoves. Quick, I yelled. Phone Lloyds of London and show me against catching fire at sea while carrying porridge. A hairy cook grabbed me just in time. This could mean promotion for you, I told him. There was food for twelve, but only two takers, Edginan and myself. We enjoyed liberal proportions of sausages, bacon, bread and butter, tea, jam, then started all over again, all to the sound of great agonised retching groans. Feeling fine, we tried to bring joy to our less fortunate comrades by saying, cold, greasy tripe and raw eggs. We had to be quick. Edgin and I promenade out of the deck. Harry stopped. If only I had a chew. Why, I said. Well, it's quicker by chew, he said. With 80% illness, we had to take turns on the anti-aircraft guns. The night I was on was a frightening affair. One of the men on the Beaufort guns forward was washed overboard. Next morning there was a service in the canteen for him. Poor bastard. The storm never let up. It was only this that prevented new boat attacks. Though I know many a sick-covered wreck who would rather have had calm seas and been torpedoed. A poor green-faced thing asked, Any, any bloody cure for seasickness? Yes, I said, sit under a tree. I had to be quick. Gunnar Ollins had been told deaf people never got sick. He spent the rest of the storm with his fingers in his ear. The ship now was one big vomit bucket. On the night of the 14th, we had passed through the Straits of Gibraltar into the Mediterranean, and gone was the gale. All was calm. The Med, the Mediterranean, 
This threw the speculation book wide open. Bomri Roshi was taking bets. Malta, 6-4. India, 20-1. Libya, 6-4. Algeria, 11-10 on. Bournemouth, 100-1. Most of us thought it would be Algeria. As we passed further through the straits, the sea went calm like a satisfied mistress. Darkness gathered quickly, and lo, across the straits were the glittering lights of all electric tangiers. The port rail was crowded. We hadn't seen so many lights since they went out on that September day in 1939. I thought sadly of blacked-out Britain. But look at the money we were saving. With Doug Kidgel, I watched the magic glow of tangiers. Do you think we could swim it, I said. Yes, he said. It's only about three to five miles. He was a superb swimmer, and for that matter, so was I. I told him if we did, we'd be sure of ending the war alive. They'd make us, said Doug, do time in the nick. That's right, I said. We'd be saved in the nick of time. We didn't swim to Tangiers that night. Tannoys came to life. Cigarettes out on deck. It was dark. Harry and I promenaded the decks. The night was warm, clear, starry. The air was like balm. Phosphorus trailed in our wake like undersea glowworms. We were given permission to sleep on the top deck provided no late-night customs were performed at the ship's rails. The joy of lying on your back facing a starry sky is something I remember for its sheer simplicity. Not that we weren't living a simple life. Oh, no. We were all bloody simple or we wouldn't be in this boat. With the storm behind us, Chater Jack, MCDSO, tired of throwing empty whiskey bottles overboard, decided life was dull. The band was to play for dancing in the officer's lounge from 2130 bells to 2359 bells. Regarding this, I quote from a letter I had from Chater Jack in March 1958, in which he recalled the occasion. Many episodes may well come up during your reminiscence on Friday. One vivid one to me starts as early as our embarkation in Liverpool. We had been well warned by RHQ that if we were spotted trying to camouflage the band instruments among the embarkation stores, they would go into the sea. Being fairly efficient soldiers, we embarked the band, camouflaged as I know not what, and there the matter ended for the moment. It ended until we had survived the Bay of Biscay, through which the vessel rolled almost over the danger angle, though most people were below decks, beyond caring, slung in hammocks and racked with seasickness. Surviving all this, we turned towards Jim. The sun shone, the sea was calm, and a band was badly wanted. RHQ asked shamefacedly if we had wangled it on board, and we admitted to poker face that we had. All was well. The band played, people struggled on deck, the sun shone, and we approached Algiers in full fine fettle. It was fun rummaging in the hold among Bren carriers and cannons to find a drum kit. Oh, God, said Alf, my guitar's all packed up for the trip. Well, I said, let's unpack it. We can pretend it's Christmas. He hit me. That night we were in great form. It was a great feeling playing jazz. Most certainly it never started a war. The floor space was limited and crowded with pump-handled couples. There were service ladies with the predominance of Queen Alexander nursing sisters. Where were they when the decks were strewn with seasick soldiers? We saw strange gyrations as the ship rolled the dancers into the corner, then rolled them back to the other one. To include cocking of the legs, we played a reel. Sure enough, they responded like Pavlov's dogs. At the evening's end, Major Chaterjack, MCDSO, thanked the band and passed the hat round for some financial tribute. A mean bastards. We'd have got more if we'd sold the hat. We had to restrain Harry from playing the Warsaw Concerto. Major Chaterjack, MCDSO, made it up by giving us half a bottle of whiskey. Swinging gently in hammocks, we passed the bottle back and forth until we fell into a smiling sleep. It was the best day we'd had at sea. From now on, the weather improved. Those who had suffered sickness were now strong enough to lie down without help. The morning after the dance was perfect. Clear sky, no wind, calm sea. We were dive-bombed. Tin hats on, boomed the tannoy. Gun crews were all caught with their pants down. There was some kind of medical inspection on at the time. Chater Jack's batman awakened him. Sir, a night day plane is bombing us. Don't worry, said Chater Jack. He's allowed to. And added, did you get his number? It was an old lumbering three-engine Caproni. We let fly a few rounds at him. It didn't seem fair. It's like shooting a grandmother. So I waved him goodbye. After this attack, gun crews became trigger-happy. The sight of a seagull was a signal for a thunderous barrage. It had to be stopped. The captain addressed us over the tannoy. Gentlemen, all seagulls in the area are unarmed, and we can refrain from shooting at them. Thank you. 
Edgington had something to say about this. Seagulls, yes. What about fish? We were travelling through fish-infested waters, many of them sympathetic to the German cause. You're right, Colonel, I said. There should be regular fish inspections, each being tasted for identification. Me, sir, this fish tastes like a Gestapo, Sergeant. Edgington, right, drown it at once. Me, it's not frightened of water. Edgington, then drown it on land. Poison a hill and make it eat it. Me, yes. Edgington, that yes sounds very suspicious. Me, don't worry, it's one of ours. Edgington, good. You can stand by me to rely on you. Me, I always remembered you like that. Here I point to a coil of greasy rope. Edgington, ah, I was very poor then, but now... Me, but now what? But now I'm very poor then. We were only twenty-one. The end of the voyage was in sight. We wanted to get ashore before the equipment was out of date. Over the tannoy... Good morning, Colonel Meadows speaking. I'm going to put you all out of your agony. It's too late for me. I can tell you all our destination. Cheers. Hooray! We are to land at Algiers as reinforcements for the First Army. We will be fighting alongside the Americans, who we welcome to this theatre of operations. So, we're going to an operating theatre, grinned Harry. We should be docking at 10.30 tomorrow. From there, you will go to a transit camp for brief training. We should be in action three weeks from now. Mixed groans and cheers. Good luck to you all, replies of good luck, mate. Algiers? Wasn't that where Charles Boyer once had it off with Hedy Lamar in the Casbah? Mind you, they got out while the going was good. The rest of the day we spent packing kit. We were issued with an airmail letter in which we were allowed to say we'd arrived safe and sound, news which would now make everybody happy at home. From now on, all mail was censored. We were no longer allowed to give the number of troops, measurements of guns, and ammo returns to the German embassy in Spain. This, of course, would cut our income down considerably. So there it was, tomorrow, North Africa. I wrote the name on a bit of paper. It might come in useful. That evening, with the sun setting, we gathered all around Major Chetajek on the promenade deck and sang old songs. The sea was still, the ships were at a slow speed, as the sound of, You are my sunshine, run, rabbit, run, drink to me only, were wafted across the waters. It all seemed very nostalgic. It must have struck terror into the breasts of any listening Germans. Algiers on January the 18th, 1943, I wrote in my diary, Arrived Algiers at dawn. Harry and I got up early to enjoy the sight of Africa at first light. We saw it bathe in a translucent, pre-dawn purple aura. Seagulls had joined us again. A squadron of American Lockheed Lightning circled above. The coast was like a wine-coloured sliver, all the while coming closer. The visibility grew as the sun mounted the sky. There is no light so full of hope as the dawn. Amber, resin, copper lake, brass green. One by one they shed themselves until the sun rose golden in a white sky. Lovely morning warmth. I closed my eyes and turned my face to the sun. I fell down a hatchway. Awake, said Harry down the hole, for morning in a bowl of night has put the stone that puts the stars to flight. Omar Kayan. Get stuffed, Spike Milligan, I replied. The convoy was now in line ahead, making for the port. Gradually, the buildings of Algiers grew closer. The city was built on a hill and tiered. Most buildings were white. We were closing to the dockside. Activity. Khaki figures were swarming everywhere. Trucks, tanks, anti-aircraft guns, shells, all were being offloaded. Odd gendarmes looked helpless. Occasionally blew whistles, pointed at Arabs, and then hit them. They'd lost the war, and by God they were going to take it out on somebody. Now we could see the palm tree line boulevards. We made the last raid on the canteen and stocked up with fags, chocolates, and anything. In full FSMO, pronounced FSMO, we paraded on deck. I tell you, each man had so much kit, it reminded me of that bloody awful Warsaw Concerto. A bombardier came round and distributed little booklets saying customs and habits of French North Africa, how to behave, the currency, addresses of post-brothel military clinics, and a contraceptive. Only one? They must be expecting a short war. Harry Edgington was horrified. Look at this, he said, his lovely face dark with rage, putting temptation in a man's hands, whereupon he hurled it overboard. Others blew them up and paddled them ashore, shouting, Happy New Year! 
Down came the gangplanks, and the 56th Heavy Regiment, ten days at sea, heavier than it had ever been, the boost. There were no transports save those to carry kit bags and luggage. Chucky and I were lucky again. You two stay behind. Supervise the loading of all battery kit bags onto that three-tonner, said Sergeant Dawson. Unloading went on all day. The harbour was glutted with ships unloading war supplies and what occasionally looked suspiciously like three-piece sweets from Harrods. Throughout the dusty day, the cranes were lifting and dipping like herons fishing. Our battery baggage was identified by colour, a blue square with a yellow stripe up the middle. We rode up and down in cargo nets. Puzzled Algerians watched us as we rose from the bowels of the ship, singing Anne Ziegler and Webster Booth melodies. Only a rose I give you. Ever present were the Arabs, waiting to nick things, but it was easy to stop them. You hit them. It was appalling, really, to see a people so impoverished. They wore rags. They were second-class citizens. They were degraded. It hurt most when you saw the children. I'm bloody glad I wasn't French. Even better, I'm glad I wasn't an Arab. But seriously, folks, by sunset the job was completed and we were exhausted by a hard day's singing in the nets. Lieutenant Hughes fell us in. We marched through the palm-lined streets into a vast concrete football stadium. On the pitch were scores of tents. Must have been half time, I thought. But no, these were the bivouacs of a Scotch battalion just back from the front. Hanging up with the washing lines were battle-scarred kilts. It must have been hell under there. It was a vast concrete football stadium. I mentioned that again in the nature of an encore. All the action was around a field kitchen. Several queues all converged on one point where a cook with a handlebar moustache and, of all things, a monocle, was doling out. He once had a glass eye that shot out when he sneezed and fell in the porridge, so he wore the monocle as a sort of optical condom. He doled out something with my mess tin. What is it? I asked. Uh, Irish stew, he said. Then I replied, Irish stew in the name of the law. Ta-da! <laughs> it was a vast concrete arena. We queued for an hour. When that had passed, we queued for blankets. Next, find somewhere to sleep, like a football stadium in North Africa. We dossed down on the terraces. After ship's hammocks, it was murder. If only, if only I had a grand piano, I could have slept on that. I could even have played that bloody awful Warsaw Concerto. Anything was better than a vast concrete arena. At dawn, my frozen body signaled me, Arise! I stamped around the freezing terrace to get warm. I lit up a fag and went scrounging. There were still a few embers burning in the field kitchen. I found a tea urn full of dead leaves from which I had managed to get a fresh brew. A sentry turned up. Bleeding coal, in it, he said. Yes, I replied, and he seemed well pleased with the answer. After all, it was free and unsolicited. I shared the tea with him. My name's Eric Rushton, he said. In Civi Street, I'm a porter in Covent Garden. Good, I thought. There's nothing like coming to Aldiers to meet a fruit porter called Rushton from Covent Garden. Who knows, before sun-up, I might even meet an apprentice gasfitter's mate called Dick Scruel from Lewisham. If so, he'd have to hurry, as Dawn's left hand was already in the sky. A small man in an overcoat drew nigh. Uh, you're not Dick Scruel from Lewisham, are you? Uh, no, he said. People keep asking me that. I gave him some tea. It had been a near thing. Gradually, the sun came up. Well, there was no way of stopping it. It rose from the east like an iridescent gold Napoleon. It filled the dawn sky with swathes of pink, orange, and flame. Breakfast was bully beef and hard tack. I washed and shaved under a tap, icy cold. Still, it was good for the complexion. Gunners, stay lovely for your commanding officer with Algerian football stadium water. I stood at the gates watching people in the streets, and I made friends with two little French kids on their way to school, a girl and a boy. I gave them two English pennies. In exchange, they gave me an empty matchbox with a camel label on top. I shall always remember their faces. A gentle voice behind me. Where the bleeding have you been? It was Sergeant Johnny Dawson. Go on, we're over to the docks. And so we were, off to the docks. Arriving there, we checked that all D battery kit bags were on board our lorries and then drove off. The direction was east along the coast road to Jean Bar. 
We sat with our legs dangling over the tailboard. Whenever we passed French colonials, some of them gave us to understand that our presence in the dark continent was not wanted by a simple explicative gesture from the waist down. Touché. We passed through dusty, scrub-like countryside with the sea to our left. In little batches we passed Arabs with camels or donkeys, children begging or selling tangerine and eggs. The cactus fruit was all ripe, pillar box red. I hadn't seen any since I was a boy in India. The road curved gradually and the land gradient rose slightly and revealed to us a grand view of the Bay of Algiers, rich blue with morning sunshine tinseling the waves. Our driver, Cooter Price, so-called because of a magnificent large nose shaped like a pennant. When he swam on his back, people shouted, Sharks! And he was singing, I'll be seeing you as we jostle along the dusty road. It was 26 miles to our destination, with a mysterious name, X Camp, situated just half a mile inland at Cap Matifou. X Camp was proving an embarrassment to the army command. It was built to house German prisoners of war. Somehow we hadn't managed to get any. So, to give it the appearance of being a success, 56th Heavy Regiment were marched in and told that this was, for the time being, home. This is your home. When D Battery heard this, it was understandable when roll call was made the next morning. Gunner Devine, yo! Gunner Spence, yo! Gunner Mauders, yo! The march of the regiment from the ship to Cap Matifu had been a mild disaster. It started in good march style, but gradually, softened by two weeks at sea and in full FSMO, two thirds of the men gradually fell behind, and finally, everyone was going it alone at his own pace. A long string of men was stretched over 26 miles. I quote from Major Chaterjack's recollection of this incident in a letter he wrote to me in 1957. Perhaps some will remember the landing at Algiers and the ghastly march with full kit for which we were not prepared. The march ended after dark, somewhere beyond Maison Blanche, and was rather a hard initiation into war. A valuable initiation, though, for it made many things thereafter seem easier. To top it all, there was a tragedy. Driver Reed, who'd flaked out in the march, tried to hop a lift but fell between the lorry and the trailer and was squashed to death. The only way to unstick him from the road was by pulling at his webbing straps. Tragedy number two was Gunner Lee, 36, oh, quite old for a soldier. As he arrived at the camp, he received a telegram telling him his wife and three children had been killed in an air raid on Liverpool. He went insane and never spoke again. He's still in a mental home near Menston in Yorkshire. Sanitary orderly Little was learning the trade of maintenance on the outdoor hole-in-the-ground latrines. The lime powder that is normally used to sprinkle the pit had not arrived. He, being of an inventive turn of mind, mixed petrol and diesel and used that. Dawn. Enter. An RSM pleasure bent. He squats on the pole. Lights pipe, drops match. <laughs> there emerges smoked blackened figure, trousers down, smouldering shirt tail, singed eyebrows, secondary burns on the bum, a sort of uh, English loss of face. It was our last casualty before we actually went into action. Next time, it would be for real. That was Adolf Hitler, My Part in His Downfall. Written and spoken by Spike Milligan. 